terapia del tercer encuentro de lingüística formal. A nombre de la directora de la directora de la ENALT, doctora Contillo Contria, y de los organizadores de este evento, les hago llegar un saludo afectuoso y les doy la más cordial bienvenida a este evento y a nuestra transmisión en YouTube. Recuerden que podrán enviarnos sus preguntas en la caja, en la caja de comentarios de YouTube a lo largo de esta transmisión. Agradecemos a todos los ponentes por querer compartir sus valiosos conocimientos con nosotros y después de esta breve introducción, por fin podemos pasar a la parte de las ponencias. Pero antes de comenzar, recordamos que a cada ponente se le otorgará 20 minutos para presentar su trabajo y luego podremos pasar a la sesión de preguntas y comentarios. Eh, sin más preámbulo, le doy la palabra a Giuseppe Ruña de la Universidad del Estudio y Diferencia, Italia. Y el título de su trabajo es On the Distribution of Relativizes Inherited Relative Clauses in English and Romance. Uh, en 10 segundos puede comenzar. Pero, pero, um, um, Giuseppe, can you hear us? Giuseppe, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear quite well. Uh, Giuseppe, remember that you have got 20 minutes for your presentation, and then you'll be interrupted 10 minutes before the end of your presentation. All right. May I start? 10 minutes and five minutes before the end of your presentation. And then we're right. going to move on to the Q&A session. Okay. Um, so, in this presentation, I would like to uh, will attempt to develop an analysis of the distribution of relativizers in the headed relative clauses of English and Romans, and uh, of the source of variation between these two groups of languages. Um, and I will attempt to do so under a minimalist uh, framework. So we'll start by giving a brief introduction to the theoretical framework that I adopt, uh, then I'll move on to describe the data and the questions that arise from this data. Um, then I will describe the, uh, an analysis uh, developed by Norbert Richards, um, who addresses some of the questions I'm interested in here, and on which I will uh, um, uh, build my own analysis. Um, so the theoretical framework that I adopt is basically the minimalist framework as recently expanded by Chomsky, Gallego, and Ott. Um, they assume basically that merge is free, uh, that is, it is untriggered by formal features. And I will assume that the structures generated by free merge are then filtered out at the interfaces, uh, the conceptual, intentional, and the sensory motor interfaces. Uh, I assume that the mapping to the interfaces happens uh, face by face. Um, and that the externalization operation, or X, um, characterizes the mapping to the sensory motor systems, uh, which is roughly equivalent to the spell-out operation of early models. Um, so in this framework, it becomes crucial to understand the interaction between narrow syntax and the interfaces. And in this talk, uh, my aim is to analyze the distribution of uh, Romans and English relativizers in order to shed light on issues of extension. And in particular, I will be concerned with the uh, sort of contrast between uh, like one and two, um, which um, give rise to a question and from our perspective, which is if, if merge is free, uh, then what is it that allows or prevents relativizers from occurring in certain domains as opposed to others? So in one, for instance, the relativizer who uh, can occur as a bare element in uh, tense uh, relatives, in restrictive tense relatives, uh, but the very same element uh, cannot occur as a bare element in infinitarial relatives as in two. Um, and notice that also from three, that there is no ban against the presence of double-edged phrases in infinitarial relatives, um, since these are allowed to occur under pipe piping. Now, the hypothesis that I will make is that the, this distribution is conditioned at the mapping with uh, phonology uh, by morphosyntactic apology or as it a type of um, OCT, OCP effect, as also argued by Richards 2010. Uh, basically, the gist of the proposal would be that uh, whenever there are two um, features that are too um, adjacent to one another, uh, then the, uh, the mapping component rules out the structures. 
uh, before I describe the analysis, uh, I will briefly introduce the data. Uh, so first of all, I follow Kane, uh, Manzini, and Savoy, among others, in assuming that there is no categorical difference between uh, relative pronouns, like WH phrases like Spanish can, for instance, and uh, finite relative complementizers. Um, this assumption is, is not crucial for the analysis, but I will make it um, since it will allow me to offer a comprehensive analysis of, of the Romans and English facts. Uh, on a descriptive level, I will make a distinction between fine inflected uh, relativizers and uh, non inflected relativizers. Fine inflected relativizers are um, basically, I take them to be, for instance, English foo uh, or Spanish can, which are inflected for uh, the human feature of the antecedent or the Romans phrase uh, determiner plus which, like for instance, Italian equal and Spanish equal and so on, uh, which are inflected for the gender and number of the antecedent. Uh, whereas the non-inflected relativizers are um, um, K and that, for instance. So let us begin with the uh, distribution of these relativizers in restrictive tense relatives. Um, so in English, English allows the use of both the five inflected and the non-inflected relativizers. Um, um, it allows them to occur as bare elements uh, in these structures, as in four. And also optionally so, since English also allows the use of the zero relativizer, uh, abstracting away from the anti uh, that trace effects. Uh, but in Romans, um, the fine inflected relativizers are barred from occurring as bare elements, as in Italian 5a and Spanish 6a, where uh, the non inflected relativizers must be used in these cases. Um, the fine inflected relativizers can only be used under pipe piping. Um, in, uh, in Romans restricted tense relatives as in type B and 6B. So the generalization that uh, emerges here is that Romans restricted tense relatives do not allow bare fine inflected relativizers are like English, uh, whereas English also allows the use of uh, zero relativization. Uh, in a positive tense relatives, um, um, both English and Romans uh, follow a different pattern, in particular English um must employ the use must employ uh, the uh, fine inflected relativizers as in seven the man who john so and so on um but it bars the use of zero and that's relativization here in romans the use of the uh, the ban against the use of um the fine inflected um uh, relativizers is lifted in these cases uh, which can be used as in 8a uh, and 8p um, and they can be used alongside uh, the um, the uh, non-inflected relativizers as bare elements. And of course, they can also be used under pi piping uh, as in 9. Uh, visualization here is that Romans are positive tense relatives allow bare relativizers, uh, whereas English requires the presence of phi inflected relativizers and bars zero in that relativization. Um, in infinitival relatives, on the other hand, uh, English and Romans pattern alike in barring um, the occurrence of bare relativizers, uh, regardless of whether they are fine inflected or not, uh, as in 10 A and B and um, 11 A and B. Um, interestingly, interestingly, in Spanish, uh, it seems that the use of the non inflected relativizer K is allowed in these cases, as in 11 C, uh, at least from what I've been able to gather from the literature. Um, but the non inflect the defy inflected relativizer is still ungrammatical in these cases um, uh, as a bare element. Uh, both English and Romans, on the other hand, uh, allow the uh, fine inflected relativizers to occur under pipe piping as in 10C and 12. Um, so this distribution raises several questions in this uh, talk. I will attempt to address the following ones. Why does Romans, but not the English, bar their fine inflected relativizers in restrictive tense relatives? Um, why is the ban lifted in Romans a positive ten relatives, tense relatives? Um, why are fine inflected relativizers the only option in English a positive tense relatives, but not in Romans? Why are bare relativizers barred in infinitival relatives in both English and Romans, with the exception of Spanish can? And why can fine inflected relativizers occur freely under pipe piping? Uh, so as I mentioned previously, Richards um, uh, develops an analysis which addresses at least some of these questions. In particular, he focuses on the contrast between English infinitival relatives and restrictive tense relatives. 
um, which accounts uh, with analysis that is based on a condition of morphosyntactic apology, um, where it dubs the distinctness condition. The uh, gist of this proposal is basically that whenever there is a linearization statement of the form alpha alpha, uh, this, uh, so whenever there is there are two non-distinct morphosyntactic features, these are ruled out at the mapping with morphophonology, um, the XOR spell out uh, mapping. Um, and Richards assumes um, following the standard phase theory that the externalization, uh, that the mapping to phonology corresponds basically to the complement of the phase set and that alpha is subject to parameterization. So in English, um, alpha may amount to a syntactic label, which may correspond either to a maximal or a minimal projection. And it takes phase sets to correspond to CPs um, and KPs and PPs, among others. But crucially, uh, the DP is not a phase in this analysis. Um, so basically, Richards argues that the ungrammaticality of 13a uh, with um, a bare relativizer in an infinitive relative in English is due to the fact that we have uh, two um, adjacent um, non distinct um, DPs here in this case. Uh, so one is corresponds to the relativizer and the other is the external determinant, uh, which is then ruled out by the distinctness condition. And the same applies to 14 with preposition stranding. Um, whereas in 15, uh, we have uh, the, the presence of the preposition, uh, which is assumed to be a phase head, um, causes the relativizer to be externalized in a different um, spell out domain. Um, in this case, uh, a different spell out domain than the, than the external determinant, so that, the, uh, that there is no problem for, the, um, for distinctness. Um, and so the, the structure can be generated. Now, in order to account for the contrast with uh, tense relatives, um, Richards assumes the structures proposed in Bianchi in 1999, where basically the uh, DP is part of the lower projection in the CP field uh, than the uh, nominal antecedent. Um, so the nominal antecedent is contained in the relative clause um, in the specifier of the force phrase. And uh, Richards assumes that this force uh, head is a face head. And so this causes the um, uh, relativizer to be externalized in a distinct, um, in a distinct uh, spell out domain in the external determiner, allowing for the generation of 16A. Giuseppe, 10 minutes left. Yes. Thank you. Um, however, this account faces some, um, there are some open questions here. One is that it is unclear what rules out zero or that relativization in English are positive uh, tense relatives. Um, which Richards actually does not discuss at all. And uh, second, uh, it is unclear what rules out bare fine inflected relativizers in uh, Roman's uh, restrictive uh, tense relatives, as in uh, 17a, um, which if we analyze uh, with um, the set of Richards assumptions, then, um, as in 17b, for instance, uh, then um, we should expect Kien to be um, um, to be externalized uh, in 17a, as in the English equivalent. So in my analysis, I basically follow Richards in making in, in, in assuming that this distribution of relativizers is regulated at the mapping with phonology by, by morphosyntactic apology of futural distinctness. And I will also assume with him that the nominal head is part of the relative clause in restrictive tense relatives. Um, although I do not uh, commit myself to the uh, racing or the matching analysis of relative clauses, which is uh, irrelevant for my account. Um, I will be making some modifications to Richard's account. Uh, one is that, as I mentioned, I assume that complementizers are simply DPs. Um, secondly, I assume that the externalization or the Out domain contains the whole face, so the complement of the face set plus the edge, um, as argued by Boschkovich 2016. And uh, third, I assume that distinctness in Romans and also in English to some extent is sensitive to five features alongside D features. Um, in particular, I will argue that Romans bars uh, the organization statement containing two non distinct five features. Um, whereas in English, this realization statement uh, may give rise to alternative relativization strategies, uh, like for instance, uh, zero and that relativization. 
um, okay, so um, in restrictive tense relatives, uh, here uh, I, I assume that uh, Romans bars the realization statement containing phi phi, and which I assume is what rules out 18a, el hombre quien Juan Mio, um, which is analyzed as in 19a. Um, so basically assume that the nominal antecedent is part of the relative clause, um, and that uh, the externalization um, mapping um, contains the whole phase. So this will cause the antecedent and the relative Isaacian to be linearized um, in the same, uh, to, be, to be part of the same externalization domain, uh, so that the five features of Kien uh, will clash with those of, of the antecedent ombre, um, which rules out then the, the structure in, um, um, in 98. Um, in the case of a non-inflected relativizer, the relativizers here assume that these are allowed because they do not uh, bear five features, at least not overtly, and so there is no problem uh, for uh, distinctness, as in 19b. Um, and we can also account for the uh, use of the five inflected relativizers um, uh, under pipe piping, uh, as in 18b, with the analysis in 19c. Uh, where uh, the relativizer is uh, shielded by the preposition, which I'm assuming with Richard is a face set, and so um, it is linearized in a distinct uh, spell out domain. Now, in English, uh, English can uh, linearize phi phi, as in the girl who John invited for dinner, but I assume that this, um, um, that whenever we have a linearization statement of phi phi, um, that this environment uh, licenses the use of a zero and that relativization in English, um, so as in 20b. And if if this if this is if this assumption is on the right track, then we can also understand the unavailability of um, of the uses of of the use of this um, zero that relativization strategies uh, under pipe piping as in 21a. Um, since um, with pipe piping the preposition acts as a face head, and so the conditions for distinctness do, do not arise in these environments, so that uh, zero in that relativization cannot be licensed here. Um, in a positive okay. tense relative, yes? five minutes left. Yeah. Um, in a positive tense relatives, the nominal head is contained, I assume that the nominal head is contained in a distinct externalization domain instead of the relative clause, which is suggested, for instance, by the prosodic independence, and this allows me to account for the, for the availability of pair of fine inflected relativizers in Romans, as in 22a, uh, la ragazza, la quale Gianni vi dato cena, uh, I assume that ragazza is part of the matrix clause, uh, so that it will end up being externalized in a distinct um, um, externalization domain as the as the relativizer la quale. So even if la quale has bears the same five features as the antecedent, there is no problem for distinctness. And um, we can also understand the unavailability of a zero and that relativization in a positive tense relatives, assuming that such strategies are licensed only under conditions of distinctness. So uh, 23a is basically analogous to the 22. So there are no problems there, uh, but for uh, 24, the structure is ruled out. Um, I assume because there are no conditions for distinctness in this in this environment, and so um, zero in that relativization cannot be licensed. Um, in infinitary relatives, I assume that these have an impoverished structure with respect to tense relatives, as also argued by Bianchi, and uh, I moreover assume that they are not uh, strong phases, as also suggested by. Um, um, Landau for uh, infinitival uh, clauses more generally. Um, and um, here I assume that the, the, there is a distinctness for D features, uh, which is what rules out infinitival relatives with pair relative, uh, relativizers. So both 25 and 26 are uh, ungrammatical because the uh, external determiner and the uh, relativizer are part of the same externalization domain, which, um, which is then ruled out by distinctness. Um, for Spanish, I suggest that uh, Spanish is not um, uh, sensitive to, five, to, to, to D features, but only for five features, which allows me to account for 27A with K, uh, while still uh, ruling out um, uh, the presence of the, of the pair of fine inflected uh, relativizer. Well, 
Um, and um, as in Richard's account, we also predict the obligatoriness of pipe piping with relative biases in the infinitesimal relatives. Um, so uh, 28 um, is ruled out as in Richard's account. Um, whereas in 29, again, the um, preposition uh, shields the relative biases from the external determinants, so no condition of distinctness arises here. And uh, we can also account for the grammaticality of fine inflective relative biases in these environments under pipe piping in the, um, the infinitesimal relatives of Romans, as in 30a and, and 30b, which is analogous to 29. Um, so in conclusion, the proposed analysis uh, holds the minimalist assumption that merge is untriggered and degenerated structures are then filtered out at the mapping with morphophonology by conditions of morphosyntactic apology, as in Richard's account. And uh, the distribution of relative biases can be captured under this account if we make uh, two crucial modifications uh, to Richard's proposal. One is that the externalization mapping contains the whole phase, as argued by Boschkovich, and two, that Romans and also English to some extent is sensitive to five features alongside these features. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the delay. Agradecemos a José Perruña por su intervención y ahora podemos pasar a la sesión de preguntas. Ajá, adelante, por favor. So, can you hear me okay? Yes. Giuseppe, can you hear yeah. us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear quite well, but uh, did you hear the question? No, I didn't. Did you hear the qu question? No, I did not hear the question, sorry. Um, Hoping that you're going to be able to listen to this question. Uh, I, um, I actually like a, a lot of things about your analysis. I think that the distinctness condition must be playing some kind of role in the linear relation between the head of relatives and whatever comes next. Uh, I had two observations. Uh, the first one is that in your Spanish example in 18a, uh, I think that one is ruled independently because of the absence of differential case marker. You would need uh, the case marker A, and in, in which case you would actually have uh, a grammatical sentence. El hombre a quien Juan vio. So that's just a little question about the detail. And uh, the other observation has to do with those cases that are problematic for you. Un libro que leer. Uh, I think the real problem is your assumption that all these relative elements have the same category. So in, I think I'm convinced that in the case of Spanish, que, uh, there is a complementizer, que, and there is a relative pronoun, que. So if you abandon the assumption that they all have the same category, then it's not really a problem for your distinctness condition account, because this would be the complementizer, in which case you would have un libro, which is a nominal, and then que, which is a different category, which is a complementizer. Um, this may have to be parametrized for Spanish. Uh, I, I don't know the, the rest of the data. But I think it's it's there's very very strong evidence that in Spanish there are distinct uh, case and one is uh, a relative pronoun and the other one is a complementizer. But that would actually solve your problematic case for un libro que leer, I think. Uh, okay, thank you first of all for the observations um, about this latter one. Uh, I'm not actually sure that this is a problem for the analysis because uh, I'm still assuming that the, we reach that the features uh, involved in distinctness 
uh, need to be parameterized since um, this account basically revolves around the um, um, externalization component, which is subject to, to variation. Uh, but the idea that in this case a complementizer is also adopted, as you know, for English and uh, Italian, um, which in which case uh, they are ruled out. So even if we are assuming that they are complementizers, there must still be something else to be to be assumed for this type of elements um, uh, to to capture the fact that they they basically uh, distribute as regular pronouns um, at least uh, for for English and Italian. Um, but uh, for for Spanish, then uh, the idea is simply that um, there is no categorical distinctness involved, and that there is just uh, distinctness for five features. So. Um, the parameterization would involve simply the, the fact that uh, whereas the rest of the Romance languages also are sensitive to D features, uh, Spanish is not. Um, so that would be my, um, my argument here, but thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, uh, you Jose. Uh, thank you, Jose. Unfortunately, uh, I think that we have to move on to the next presentation since we started a bit later than expected. Uh, and well, thank you, thank you, Giuseppe, very much indeed for your incredible talk. Thank you. Uh, y, y ahora podemos pasar a la siguiente a la siguiente ponencia eh, a cargo de Irene Lamy y de Just Vandy Waija de la Universidad de Berlín, los dos, Suecia, y el título de su ponencia es el siguiente. Compound in turn of anaphora, evidence from acceptability judgments on Italian argumental compounds. Irene, can you hear us? Yes. Irene, Juice. Yes, um, um, it's only me. There's my co-author is not here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, um. Okay. Can you can you see the the presentation? Okay, uh, yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, and yes, my, my presentation will deal with uh, compound, the phenomenon of compound internal anaphora with evidence from acceptability judgment on Italian argumental compounds. Um, this study has been co-authored by Jos van de Weyer, uh, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, but I, I will try to, to do everything by myself. And the outline is to uh, illustrate briefly what we mean with compound internal anaphora and the current state of literature for this phenomenon uh, regarding especially anaphoric islands, the concept of anaphoric islands, whether this can be um, truly defined as islands or rather as peninsulas. We will give a brief illustration of uh, argumental compounds, especially on argumental compounds in Italian being a research focused on Italian language and with the debate on the acceptability of compound internal anaphora in Italian. And then I will briefly, uh, I mean, I will illustrate our study with uh, our research questions, our materials, and of course the results and some possible explanation for the results. Uh, well, as compound internal anaphora, we refer to the phenomenon according to which um, a pronoun can refer back to one, only one element of a complex word. Uh, complex words has been defined by Postal in 69 as anaphoric islands, meaning that syntax cannot penetrate a complex word. Um, so the examples that he gives to illustrate this phenomenon, the, the fact that the, this phenomenon is not possible is that for instance, uh, those who teach classical languages don't appreciate people who deal with modern ones. And this sentence is perfectly acceptable with ones referring back to languages being these um, a noun phrase. However, if we use a complex word, a compound, classical language teachers don't appreciate people who deal with modern ones. According to Postal, uh, ones cannot refer back to language in language teachers, uh, being this a complex word, uh, a compound and not a noun phrase. 
Uh, however, Corbin in Cavity 3, <clears throat> she said that uh, complex words are peninsulas rather than islands, meaning that sometimes syntax can access these words. And this is what Ward and others in 91 found in, uh, in their corpus study. And they found this um, interesting example here. Although casual cocaine use is down, the number of people using it routinely has increased, where it refers back to cocaine and not the whole word, complex word cocaine use. According to the author, uh, this is um, this this complex word, this compound cocaine use, is easily decomposable. So it is indeed accessible from syntax thanks to the argumental structure that tied uh, the two elements, cocaine use. Uh, so um, the argumental structure, and this is an argumental compound, is when it's given by the fact that one element works as a predicate and the other element works as the direct object of that predicate. So we have seen cocaine use, we have use, there is the predicate, and the other element, cocaine, which is the direct object of uh, the word use. Uh, in English, we have example like peak pocket, when we have a verbal uh, stem, peak and pocket, or taxi driver, which is the say it has the same structure as cocaine use. We have the direct object and then the head driver. In Italian, we can have um, three way to express these compounds. So we can have a verb noun compounds as pickpocket, for instance, tosta pane, bread toaster, uh, where we have a verbal stem and then the direct object. Then we can have the head and uh, the, the direct object, trasporto merci, freight transportation. But we also can have the head as in English on the rightmost position. So we can have auto lavaggio, where lavaggio is wash, and it's the head and it's the verbalization, which is the nominalization, sorry, and it's at the end of the compound. So the structure in which argumental compounds can be um, visible in Italian is in this scheme here. So verb noun compounds and noun noun compounds with a uh, different position of the head. Um, regarding compound internal anaphora, there is a, a long debate, um, depending actually on the theoretical background on the scholar, that uh, if their vision is more lexicalist, they tend to reject totally this phenomenon or they tend to accept it. Uh, research corpora has shown that there is um, evidence of this uh, phenomenon. However, uh, compounds in Italian are not as wide as they are in English or other Germanic languages. Uh, so there is a methodological bias because they are not as spread in corpora and especially this phenomenon here uh, is not uh, that wide, it's not that visible, but this might reflect, we are not sure if this might reflect a stylistic bias or the fact that, is, that it is impossible. So, we believe that uh, there is a methodological issue uh, at the basis of the, of the scarcity of the result in research. So we decided to have an experimental study and we decided to investigate argumental compounds uh, because we have seen the syntactic nature of the, of the argumental relation uh, as Ward and others in 91 has shown they are more open to syntactic operations and also an argumental relation is argued to be uh, more semantic um, accessible than other type of relations. Mm, we have decided as our referential expressions to use both null pronouns with null subjects and overt pronouns in the form of direct object pronouns in order to see whether there is a difference in the referential expressions. So our research questions were pretty simple. So we, we ask, is compound internal anaphora acceptable with argumental compounds? And are there any potential constraints in this uh, acceptability? So the, our materials were, we used 10 uh, verb noun compounds. So five with null pronoun and five with over pronoun. And this is an example of a sentence that we had used. Um, so the one with null subject was ho chiuso male il porta bagagli e sono caduti in mezzo alla strada. So I have crossed uh, bad, wrongly, uh, the luggage carrier and they fell in the middle of the road. Of course, we have a subject in English, but Italian being a pro-drop language, uh, we just avoided the subject. But sono caduti being plural, it's obviously referred back to a plural element 
masculine plural, which can only be bagagli, luggage. Uh, the one with over pronoun was represented by uh, an example like ho provato a riparare la lava piatti, ma continua a non pulirli bene. So I have tried to fix the dishwasher, um, but it keeps on not cleaning them well. Even in this case, we had um, uh, in, in this case we had a direct object, but even in this case we we there was no other possibility than refer back to a masculine uh, plural. So piatti, that was the only options. Um, and leaf was referring back uh, clearly to piatti. Mm, regarding left-headed compounds, uh, we had these examples here. Ho richiesto un rimborso spese, ma sono decisamente troppo alte, where uh, I have requested a reimbursement of expenses, but they are far too high where they uh, refer back to expenses. Uh, or with a direct object pronoun, ho sentito che quel trasporto merci è economico, ma non le assicura in caso di furto. Uh, I have heard that, that uh, freight transportation is cheap, but it doesn't uh, insurance the, them in case of theft, where them is the merci, the goods in transportation. It means literally is transportation goods, and them is goods. Regarding right-headed compounds, we had, uh, ho letto che la fruttipultura è molto sviluppata in questa regione e vengono coltivati in una gran parte del territorio. I have read that fruit growing is very developed in this region and they are grown in large part of the territory where they is referring back to fruit in fruit growing. And with the direct object pronoun, we have, ho sentito che l'autolavaggio ha riaperto e ora le lava anche la domenica. I have heard that a car wash has reopened and now um, it washes them also uh, on Sundays, uh, where them is the auto cars, which is actually an invariable noun. So it could be singular or plural, but we decided to have the plural not to be sure that the people understood that we were refer back to auto. Adding to that, we have 20 distractors, 10 grammatical distractors and 10 ungrammatical distractors. These, because we hide, uh, we wanted to hide the, the purpose of our experiment. So we didn't want informants to know that we were looking for answers on compounds. Um, and also we decided to have grammatical and ungrammatical distractors in order to encourage them to use all the spectrum of the scale on which the, they had to use to determine the, access, the acceptability of the stimulus. We asked 140 uh, native speakers of Italian and we decided to have them from different regions of the country. Um, there is much variation in dialects, but our data do not corroborate that. So the results were independent from the, the region of, of the informants. Mm, the 10 minutes left. Yes, thanks. The stimulus was presented auditorily. This because, uh, I don't know if you have noticed, but the right had a compound tend to be consistently written as a type compound. So as they were only one word, uh, the same is true for verb noun compounds, while noun noun compounds um, with left left headed noun noun compounds, they tend to be written as loose compounds, so in two different words. So we know uh, from psycholinguistic evidence that this might influence the perception, the processing of the whole compound. So we did we did want to avoid that the noise in the data. So we presented an auditory stimuli. So informants needed to listen to the sentence and they could listen to the sentence as many times as they uh, felt it needed. Uh, the rating was on a five point liquor scale from completely unnatural to completely natural. So our result, this is the main um, result where we see also the distractor. So as expected, ungrammatical uh, distractors uh, performed below the zero and grammatical structures performed really well. And this was, of course, expected. Um, verb noun compounds and left-headed compounds, they were um, over the zero, so they were considered acceptable. Uh, but this is not true for the right-headed compounds. So these were considered slightly acceptable by the speakers, but not the right-headed compounds. These are the general results. 
So we see in the in the bars, the lighter uh, bars, they are completely unnatural, and the darker bars, they are completely natural. So here we can see uh, a variation from um, the verb noun compounds and the left hand the compounds depending on the referential expression, which is more visible in this graph over here. Uh, so we see that verb noun compounds, they tend to accept more um, the overt uh, pronoun as it was expected, since there is literate, literature that show that overt forms tend to be more accepted in an alpha than null forms. But this is what it was not expected was this uh, in the case of left headed compounds where the opposite is actually true, where null forms are more accepted than overt forms. Right headed compounds, they, they are not accepted as we have already established, but they corroborate the fact that overt forms are more accepted anyway. So this goes against our prediction. So some possible, so these were like the, the most accepted sentences. So, for instance, ho fatto una raccolta firme e sono pronte per la prossima seduta del Consiglio. I have made a signatures collection and they are ready for the next meeting of the board, where they are is the signatures. And ho provato a usare entrambi i tostapane, ma sono rotti e lo hanno carbonizzato. I have tried to use both the bread toasters, but they're broken and burned it, where it is the bread. These were the instances uh, that informants uh, accepted the most while these were the instances that uh, informants did not uh, consider as acceptable. Ho visto quel fotomontaggio, ma non è venuto bene perché risultano molto strane. I saw that photo montage, but it didn't turn out well because they are very strange, where they are the photos. And the one that we have already seen. Ho sentito che l'autolavaggio ha riaperto e ora le lava anche la domenica. I heard that the car wash has reopened and now it washes them on Sundays as well. Some possible explanation for these results. Um, so we have said that normally over pronoun uh, are more acceptable than null pronouns, but this is not true for left-headed compounds. So we, we thought, uh, well, first uh, we need to, um, to, to distinguish the syntactic functions um, and the, uh, the, the syntactic role and the referential expression. So we, since Italian is a product language, only in the case for subject, exactly as Spanish, um, we don't actually know if it was uh, the fact that it was null form or overt form, or this was because of a differentiation in syntactic row. So the problem was that they were uh, overt forms or they were direct objects. We, we, we need further research to, to know that. Um, because we know that uh, syntactic functions are related to formatic functions. And there is a wide literature um, that investigate the correlation between subjects and topics. So we thought that information structure might be at the basis of this differentiation. So arguments might be, might work as subtopics only in the case for left-headed compounds. So if I talk about a uh, Mm, trasporto merci, uh, uh, transport, good transportation, maybe goods or trasporto latte, milk transportation, maybe milk can be, uh, can work as a subtopic for a next sentence. While if I talk about uh, apri bottiglie, uh, bottle opener, uh, maybe it's less likely that I'm talking about bottles in that case. Um, then we have uh, even thought that it might refer to boys because if I talk about signatures collection, uh, that signatures, it might be uh, the subject, but it also might be, uh, I mean, it, sorry, it might be the direct object, of course, so the collection of signatures, but it might also work as a subject in a passive form. Mm, so instead it's clearly only a direct object where there is a- Four object. minutes left. Thanks. Uh, so we need much more research, experimental research, um, on this phenomenon. Uh, experimental data are crucial, especially on the phenomenon like this that we have seen. They are not perfectly acceptable as the grammatical destructors. So they mean that they are the edge on the edge of acceptability. So we know that there is some pragmatic factors that play a role and we have to know, we have to discriminate which pragmatic factors are there and which constraints we can find in this morphosynthetic phenomenon. These were the references of our study. Thank you very much.
thank you, Lamit, for, for your presentation. And now we can move on to the Q&A session. Hmm? Uh, yes, please. Hi, thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. I have a question concerning the morphological form of the nouns, because some of them have a suffix, ejo, for example, and others only have the, um, what would have been the, the verb, the verb stem vowel. Um, is it, does it make a difference? I mean, does the order of noun noun compounds com correlate with the morphological um, structure? And could that morphological structure be a blocking factor? We, we did not find a significant uh, role played by the, the type of nominalization. Uh, however, this is, uh, this is something that it would be worth to investigate more. Um, there are not many instances of this type of compound and our compounds were carefully balanced on the usage and on the number of syllables. So it was hard to find exactly the same type of uh, nominalization. Uh, however, our data do, do not seem to reflect uh, change depending on the morphological uh, change of nominalization, but it's definitely worth of uh, further research. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Let me see. Um, no, any comments, observations? Um, no, I don't think so. In this case, Irene, thank you very much indeed for, for, for your time, for this incredible talk. And I think that all of us learned a lot from, from your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you very much. Um, y ahora podemos tomarnos un pequeño descanso y nos veremos aquí a las 10.15. Muchas gracias. Sí, no, ahorita vamos a hacer. Irma. Irma, ¿estás ahí? Víctor, sí, pero recuerda que seguimos transmitiendo. No, si no, le vamos a seguir así como, como hemos estado haciendo. Pero no estuvo tan mal. No, 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 no estuvo tan mal. Yo creo que este ya no lo... Este...
Ya tienen... Ya tienen... Eh, ya tienen el de anfitrión. Entonces les vuelvo a mandar la invitación para irnos a una sala pequeña. ¿Ok?
No. Le pido presentarse. Ok, ok. Uh -huh. Eh, muy buenos días, mi nombre es Maxim Barkov y tendré el gusto de moderar el segundo bloque de las ponencias de hoy. La siguiente ponencia estará a cargo de Aretusa Yanacú, de la Universidad de Nicosia, Chipre, y el título de su presentación es The Distribution of Subjects in Heritage Greek in Contact with Spanish in Chile. Usted Aritusa podrá comenzar en 10 segundos. Adelante, por favor. Hola, buenos días a México. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the sound is okay, right? Um, my name is uh, Aritusa Yanaku. Uh, the study that I will present today um, uh, is about subject distribution in heritage Greek in contact with Spanish in Chile. Uh, the aim of this study is to capture linguistic variation in the distribution of um, subjects in adult bilingual speakers in three different types of bilingual speakers, namely first-generation immigrants, heritage speakers of Greek, and L2 speakers uh, of Greek, all of them residing in Chile. The focus is on the use of the third-person null end of word subject, um, uh, subject in topic continuity and topic shift discourse contexts. In this uh, bilinguals of uh, Greek and Chilean uh, Spanish, which are two typologically similar null subject languages. Greek and Spanish as null subject languages both have uh, rich uh, agreement marking on verbs and they both have two types of uh, subject pronouns, overt subject pronouns and uh, null subjects, phono phonologically null pronouns. Now, null and overt pronominal subjects are not in free uh, variation uh, in null subject languages, which means that their use is not strict. Optional, uh, Aritusa, I'm very sorry yes. to interrupt you, but unfortunately, I don't think we can see the slides. Oh, when yes, yeah, they're not moving, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we need to switch to the presentation mode, so maybe go full screen. And right now, they are not moving. Uh, mm. what can you see right now? Can you see the first slide or uh, I can't hear you. We, we can see just the first slide. Was uh, it so what, hmm. first slide or was it what we supposed to see everything like the second, the third no, slide, or just the first one? No, no, I'm on the third slide about the theoretical background. So what can I do? I, I will stop sharing and start again. Yes, no, 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 it works much better. Thank you. And apologies for, for this inconvenience. So uh, can you see that I'm changing the slides? Great, thank you. Um, so uh, the focus is on the um, on the third personal and overt uh, subjects. The distribution and interpretation of um, pronominal subjects is regulated pragmatically in the discourse by discourse factors. Therefore, it involves the interface between uh, syntax and discourse pragmatics. Uh, topic continuity and topic shift contexts um, involve the interface between syntax and uh, discourse or pragmatics. And this can be illustrated uh, by considering this example. Uh, Juan vio a Pedro cuando uh, él se le acercó, cuando se le acercó. In Spanish and in Greek, this would be o Yanis ide ton Pedro, o tan aftos ton pesiase, o tan ton pesiase. 
we may use a null or an overt uh, pronominal subject in the embedded uh, clause in Greek, and the same holds for Spanish. Um, now, the null subject encodes topic continuity or subject maintenance. Uh, so in this example, the null subject refers back uh, to the subject antecedent. Uh, whereas the overt form aftos in Greek, L, uh, in Greek is the marked form. It marks non-coreference between the matrix and the embedded subject. In other words, um, it marks topic shift or subject discontinuity. So in the example here, the overt pronominal subject aftos uh, is not ungrammatical, but it is less expected. Uh, it is considered to be infelicitous in Greek in case of subject discontinuity, uh, sorry, in case of subject continuity or topic continuity, because it is uh, redundant. Uh, so you can see this information here, the word subject pronoun marks topic shift and focus, uh, contrast or emphasis, emphasis, but focus is not uh, addressed in the present study. Now, the interface between syntax and discourse pragmatics has been shown to be vulnerable, uh, a vulnerable domain in bilingualism. Previous research has shown overextension of the scope of the overt subject pronoun in contexts where um, null subjects are discursively expected. The pattern emerging from research works shows this kind of use of overt uh, pronouns. And this has been found in different uh, situations of language contact and bilingualism, such as in uh, L1 attrition, heritage bilingualism, and L2 learners, lear uh, learning. Uh, so there is overextended use of, or uh, acceptance of overt subject pronouns by L2 learners and bilinguals compared to uh, monolingual um, native speakers. And interestingly, this has been found even in pairs of null subject languages. Um, this linguistic behavior can be explained by the interface hypothesis. Uh, with regard to reference forms, the interface hypothesis framework has been very influential. Uh, the hypothesis states that in linguistic domains in which morphosyntax interacts with discourse pragmatics, uh, discourse or pragmatic factors, such as the use and interpretation of anaphoric expressions, bilingual speakers do not reach monolingual uh, native-like performance. Uh, overuse of overt subject pronouns attested in combinations of uh, null subject languages, even though it is an apparently temporary phenomenon in L2 learning, is um, in fact a counterintuitive finding given the facilitative inference of the other language. So Sorace and colleagues found that um, Italian and Spanish bilinguals overextend the use of overt pronouns in Italian. And since, since um, uh, overextension of the scope of the overt subject pronoun in the non-primary language of bilinguals cannot be attributed to parametric cross-linguistic influence, it may be explained as a compensatory strategy occurring due to bilingualism itself. More specifically, they say that the ability to efficiently coordinate and process syntactic and pragmatic uh, information in real-time performance is affected by uh, the simultaneous activation of the two linguistic systems, which moves attentional resources uh, away from other linguistic tasks. So bilinguals may rely on overt uh, subject pronoun by default whenever they uh, fail to integrate and coordinate syntactic and discourse uh, information because of the increased processing load uh, they experience, which results in default strategies, such as the, the, the use or overuse of the overt subject pronoun. Uh, however, the cross-linguistic influence cannot be ruled out. Um, it has been found that the Spanish and the Italian pronouns differ in that the Spanish pronoun is more open to co-referential co readings with either subject or object reference than its Italian counterpart. And there's also a difference between the Greek and the Spanish pronouns. The Greek uh, uh, pronoun is used more categorically because it is a strong pronominal with deictic features, which is not the case for its Spanish uh, counterpart. 
Um, now, um, as regards the present study, uh, relatively little is known on Greek as a heritage or a minority language in the context of migration uh, from a linguistic uh, perspective, especially in contact with Spanish and especially in Latin America. Um, now, heritage language is broadly defined here as a language other than the majority official societal uh, language spoken by immigrants and their children. Uh, I can give you more information about uh, Greeks in Chile um, later if you wish. In my study, I included three different um, groups of Greek and Spanish bilinguals, all of which speak Greek as a minority or a family language in the context of migration, one way or another. Uh, the bilingual main bilingual one acquisition, later to and later to acquisition. Uh, so my bilingual participants are first-generation immigrants, um, heritage speakers, and heritage early to speakers. Um, oral proficiency of the heritage speakers and the I2 speakers was measured based on a grammaticality um, index, uh, index. And um, uh, of course, when we uh, study heritage populations, there are methodological considerations uh, that we need to take into account. Uh, the social linguistic profiling of heritage speakers is uh, very important. Um, in the present study, I wanted to see whether Greek in contact with Spanish is different from monolingual Greek in the distribution of third personal and overt pronominal subjects, and if so, what causes divergence? The age factor uh, was uh, also taken into account. So based on previous research and the cross-linguistic differences in the distribution of Spanish and Greek subject pronouns, it was hypothesized that the performance of bilingual should be different compared to monolinguals. If the prediction of the interface hypothesis this is correct, then overuse of uh, overt subjects and misinterpretation of overt subject pronouns was expected to be found due to more tax processing resources, uh, possibly reinforced by cross-linguistic influence from Spanish to Greek. So the aim was to compare Greek data from monolinguals and bilinguals in order to find whether and to what extent there is divergence in the distribution of subjects in Greek in a situation of language contact with Spanish. I examined both production and uh, interpretation in two different tasks. For the production data, I elicited semi-spontaneous speech from 116 uh, participants. You can see the numbers here. There's also a wide age range because the age factor was also uh, examined with the same data. Uh, so these data were um, obtained from oral narratives using two picture story description tasks. Uh, the participants were presented with this series of pictures and were asked to narrate a brief story with each uh, sequence. Uh, crucially, they were instructed to pretend to tell the story to an imaginary listener who could not see the pictures, because in this way it is assumed that there is no situation of shared knowledge be between the interlocutors. Uh, the narratives were transcribed and coded, and I used data for the statistical analysis, and um, I used um, logistic regressions and Pearson chi-square tests. Um, I examined uh, 3,911 clauses involving... Ten minutes left. Thank you. Um, these clauses involve topic continuity and topic shift. So let's see the results. Um, starting with the context of uh, topic continuity, um, the preferred way of uh, expressing topic continuity was using null subjects as expected. And as you can see here in the bar graph, in all groups of speakers, the frequency of overt subject pronouns was insignificant, so there was no overuse of overt subject pronouns in topic continuity context in bilingual Greek. And also all groups used lexical subjects to express topic maintenance at a small rate. We have some statistically significant results here. Uh, the statistically significant differences that you can see here involve the rates of lexical subjects. The heritage speakers and the L2 speakers used significantly more lexical subjects in topic continuity than 
um, the monolingual Greek speakers and the immigrants. In addition, the L2 group used significantly more uh, lexical subjects in, uh, in, um, in topic continuity than the heritage speakers. So uh, instead of overuse of overt subject pronouns, we observe overuse of lexical subjects in the heritage speakers groups and even more in the L2 group. So lexical subjects in topic continuity are considered to be redundant, hence infelicitous, because their antecedent is already uh, said. However, the qualitative analysis showed that most of the cases of lexical subjects in topic continuity were actually not infelicitous. Uh, they were pragmatically appropriate. So 77% of the lexical subjects in topic continuity were marked as felicitous, non-redundant. And only 23% of the lexical subjects were marked as redundant, infelicitous. Um, and here we can see an example. Uh, it's not, we can skip it. Uh, for now, uh, so in topic shift context, a topic shift involves topic reintroduction. Um, the preferred way of marking uh, topic shifting narratives was with a lexical subject in all groups of speakers. The overt subject pronoun was also found to a smaller rate, but crucially, no significant differences were found between the Greek speaking groups regarding the overt subject pronoun. All groups also employed null subjects in topic shift. The relative frequency of null subjects was higher than that of the overt subject pronouns in this context. The heritage speakers ex exhibited a significantly higher rate of null subjects in topic shift almost 35% compared to both uh, Greek monolinguals and the l 2 Now, all the cases of null subjects in topic shift were marked as ambiguous or non-ambiguous after examining their context. No ambiguity means that the referent of the null subject could be clearly established because it was identified in the preceding discourse and there were no competing reference. So the majority of uh, null subjects in topic shift were actually not uh, ambiguous. The bilinguals, however, manifested greater percentages of ambiguous null subjects, as uh, can be seen in the graph, with statistically significant differences between the bilingual groups and the Greek monolinguals. In order to explore the factors that affect occurrence of ambiguity in production of the bilinguals, the variables age at testing and proficiency were examined. Proficiency was not found to be significant in relation to ambiguity in the groups of heritage speakers and uh, doers. The relationship between age and ambiguity was uh, analyzed performing a non-parametric t-test and the results showed a significant association between the variables, indicating that more cases of ambiguity were produced by participants of older ages. Um, the immigrant participants were then divided into two groups, younger immigrants and older immigrants, and further analysis showed overuse of null subjects um, by the heritage speakers and the, uh, the older immigrants. So older immigrants patterned with heritage speakers and this group produced significant over lexical subjects compared to Greek monolinguals, younger immigrants, and the L2s. So um, uh, the majority of instances of unresolved ambiguity were produced by the older immigrants. And crucially, there is no age effect in the Greek monolinguals, which means that ambiguity is enhanced by bilingualism effects in speaking in the less used, less dominant language. I have some uh, data here. We can see them later if you want. And I would like to continue with the interpretation data, which were elicited from the same groups of speakers, but with some minor um, differences in the group. Uh, the Five minutes left. Thank you. The instrument was a biclosal forward and upward resolution task uh, modified from Master Pavel and colleagues. It was an offline self-paced listening task in the form of an oral comprehension questionnaire with no visual cues. 
the participants listened to recorded sentences and then answered orally a comprehension question included in the recording for each sentence. Definiteness of the object was taken into account, but it actually didn't play a, a significant role, so I will not address uh, definiteness at, at all here. Only the participants' antecedent preferences for each subject form. So these are uh, some of the uh, examples of the items. The old lady was kissing the nurse when she, or uh, uh, with an or overt subject, was putting on her coat. Who was putting on uh, the coat? In the resolution of the overt subject pronoun, uh, the participants clearly indicated their preference for the object antecedent, which means that the overt subject pronoun in Greek clearly indicates topic shift in interpretation, as we can see here, as well as in the production data, which is not the case for the Spanish pronoun. We can also see this data here. In resolving the groups performed at chance level with no statistically significant differences. And um, an interesting uh, finding was an age effect in Greek monolinguals and immigrants in our subject uh, resolution. So being older Greek monolingual or older immigrant increases the chance of selecting the object instead of the subject antecedent. And there was no age effect uh, in the overt subject uh, pronoun resolution. So in some, um, in both monolingual and bilingual Greek, overt subject pronoun resolution shows a clear bias towards the object antecedent. There is no um, interpretation of the overt subject pronoun involving topic continuity in bilinguals. Therefore, no overextension of the scope of the overt subject pronoun was found. The null subject uh, resolution was at chance level, and there was an age effect in null subject uh, resolution. Being older increases the chance of linking the null subject to the older to the object um, antecedent. So generally, uh, no extension of the scope of the overt subject pronoun was found in Greek and Spanish bilinguals, contrary to. Um, um, the, um, the prediction stemming, stemming from the interface hypothesis. The Greek overt subject pronoun uh, is resistance to language contact effects and or cross-linguistic influence uh, due to its strong deictic feature. Um, it has a strong markedness. It is uh, deictically marked because it is the demonstrative and this renders its use relatively categorical. So it is less flexible, less ambiguous, hence less vulnerable in a language contact situation with Spanish. And um, the prediction of the representational account actually um, is borne out by these findings. According to this account, the two languages instantiate a complex pragmatic setting, thus no underspecification of the discourse interpretable features would be expected, no optionality in the performance of bilinguals of this language pair is uh, predicted. So instead, um, um, overextension of lexical subjects, full noun phrases was found. Uh, this may be a tendency towards overspecification, but the qualitative analysis of the data showed that these cases were mostly uh, felicitous as they didn't uh, involve redundancy. Um, so in the use and interpretation of uh, null subjects, it was found that null subjects were uh, used flexibly. Uh, and they involve um, ambiguity, um, potentially communication breakdown. So they are in felicitous. In felicitous, null subjects are uh, more problematic. There was overextension of the scope of the null subjects in heritage speakers and older immigrants. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but unfortunately, we have to wrap up the presentation. Maybe just some final words that you would like mm -hmm. us to take away yes. from, from your talk. Mm -hmm. um, I would like just to mention that overuse of null subjects has been found in other studies, especially in heritage speakers and L2 learners. 
and um, it, I would like to highlight the age effect in null subject to use and interpretation because the older uh, immigrants tend to use more ambiguous null subjects in topic shift contexts, which can be interpreted as a weakness at the level of language control during the uh, online processing. Um, okay, so that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Congratulations to our speaker, Aritusa. Thank you very much indeed yeah. for this incredible talk and fascinating topic. And now we can move on to the Q&A session. Ahora podemos pasar a la sesión de preguntas. Eh, uh -huh. Adelante, por favor. Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, hi, Aritusa. Um, would you Hello. please um, address the remaining points that you could not get to in the remaining moments as a response to my question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the, the, the last point that I would like to mention uh, is that um, I would like to highlight the, the age effect. Uh, the older uh, participants um, tended to link the null subjects to the on the NAFRA resolution uh, test. So this may be interpreted as uh, the recency of mention strategy that is mentioned in the literature. And I would also like to uh, highlight the fact that null subjects um, are flexible and ambiguous. And finally, um, there is another uh, hypothesis which may account for the findings, the vulnerability hypothesis by uh, Perez, which predicts that structures that show variable distributions are permeable, while um, those uh, that exhibit categorical distributions are not. And I think that this is very relevant for this study because the more categorical distributions, such as the overt subject pronoun in Greek, was less vulnerable in this study in cross-linguistic uh, inference um, related to, uh, in comparison to uh, the null subject. The null subject it's more, is more variable, uh, thus more uh, vulnerable in a language contact uh, situation. Uh, so that's all. Thank you very much for this opportunity. La siguiente pregunta, por favor. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh... Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just wanted to know uh, if in the resolution tasks for the null subject, uh, did you guys control the, the time of response or just the final answer regardless of the time of response? Yes. Um... Thank you. We didn't measure the time of the response, but we uh, only said the participants that they had to respond as quickly as they could. So we wanted to avoid met metalinguistic awareness. Uh, so they just had to respond with their first intuition, but we didn't measure the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have still got time for one more question or maybe comment that, uh -huh. yes, please. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, you said that the pronoun in Greek is uh, the demonstrative. Is this also true for the non-nominative things? So for example, that the equivalent of para él in Spanish, él in subject position and para él um, have the same form, but I think, um, Greek has case, so do they look different? No, they are exactly the same. Actually, we have the demonstrative uh, a form, which is used for the personal pronoun as well. And that's why it has deictic features, and it is different from the, 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 pro, the, the, the Spanish pronoun. There is a, a difference there, not only in the nominative. Um, and I guess that would be all um, regarding this presentation. Aritusa, once again, thank you for, for being with us today and for giving this incredible talk. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Y ahora podemos pasar a la siguiente ponencia de Albert Trevero y de Carlos Felipe Pinto, de uh, los dos ponentes de la Universidad Federal de Bahía, Brasil. Y el tema, el título de su presentación es El sujeto antepuesto Hola, hola, ¿me escucha? Buenos días. Ya, yeah. voy a compartir la pantalla. Bueno, eh, se ve la, la diapositiva. Que no tengo. Bueno, está todo bien con la presentación. Se ve, todos pueden ver. Porque no escucho nada. Sí, sí, sí se ve todo. Uh -huh. Muy bien. Eh, bueno, soy Albert, soy eh, de Brasil, de la Universidad Federal de Bahía, UFBA. Bueno, aquí hoy voy a presentar una temática que está relacionada con mi tesis de maestría esa presentación se daría por mí y por mi orientador, Carlos Felipe Pinto, pero él no pudo estar presente por cuestiones de salud. Así que voy a empezar. Bueno, empiezo hablando sobre el caso, ¿sí? que es una categoría gramatical que se hace presente en todas las lenguas humanas, en algunas el caso se manifiesta morfológicamente como suele, como pasa con el latín, mientras que otras, el caso no hay poca, el caso, perdón, hay poca realización visible, como pasa con el portugués, el español, el inglés, manifestándose abstractamente. Abajo tenemos un panorama así general eh, de los siguientes núcleos en uno que son responsables por el chequeo eh, del caso. Tenemos ahí el T finito, sí que licencia el caso nominativo al DP en posición de especificador y tenemos el predicado verbal que le asigna caso acusativo a su complemento, la preposición que le asigna caso oblicuo a su complemento. Hay un principio que garantiza que un DP pronunciado tenga caso, que es el filtro de caso, ¿sí? Eh, principio eh, que Chomikis Lanike trae, propone para las sentencias de las lenguas naturales. En dos podemos ver cómo ese principio funciona. Tenemos ahí 2A y 2B. 2A. El niño trajo un balón para su hermanito y 2B con la pronominalización de los DPs de arriba, él lo trajo para mí. Entonces tenemos aquí el niño que verifica caso nominativo por, eh, por el núcleo infinito, sí, por estar en una, en una posición de especificador, un balón 
que verifica caso acusativo de su predicado verbal y su hermanito que verifica caso oblicuo de la preposición. Y lo comprobamos en 2B. Eh, el portugués brasileño y el portugués europeo hay un... Hay un licenciamiento distinto sí, del sujeto, que es la posibilidad eh, de marcación de casos sí, del sujeto antepuesto a una oración no finita, justamente porque esta lengua posee infinitivo flexionado, como vemos, comprobamos en tres. María Vius Amigos Hiren. Eh, observamos aquí que el DP Us Amigos. Verifica casos justamente de la flexión del infinitivo. En el, en el español estándar, eh, construcciones como esta, como tres, no es posible. Justamente porque esa lengua no posee eh, flexión de infinitivo, como se nota en cuatro. Compré leche para mi mamá hacer el pastel. Vemos que es una, eh, una oración completamente agramatical en el español estándar. Sin embargo, Toribio muestra, ven acá para nosotros, verte como una construcción posible en el español del Caribe. Así, lo que se cuestiona en esta presentación es que está licenciando caso al sujeto antepuesto a las oraciones no finitas en el español caribeño una vez que esa lengua tampoco dispone de flexión de infinitivo. Eh, se sabe que el español de América ha recibido contribuciones lingüísticas de los cuatro continentes, como señala Lipsky. Eh, algunos investigadores como Eric Surreña, eh, no, eh, 1940, Suñe, 1986, Lipsky, 1996, Toribio, 2000, y más reciente, Rivero 2019, muestra, eh, discute sobre ese fenómeno lingüístico del sujeto preverbal antepuesto, ¿sí? el sujeto preverbal delante de una oración infinitiva en el español del Caribe. Así presento algunos datos eh, de mi tesis de maestría donde investigué, investigué dos variedades lingüísticas, el español de Cuba y el español de Venezuela, donde encontré algunos de esos datos que ustedes pueden visualizar ahí en CES. CESA y me dieron medicamento como para dos meses sin yo pagar ni un bolívar. CES B, antes de yo comprar esos zapatos, yo les vi los zapatos de ella. CES C, Oye, me ha costado muchísimo para yo tener mi casa y todavía no lo he tenido. 6 d perdón. Entonces, lo único para ser feliz es yo tener mi casa propia. Eh, fíjense que las oraciones 6 a c son cláusulas subordinadas eh, con presencia de, de una preposición, como está señalada aquí en César, 6B, 6C, pero observamos eh, 6D como una cláusula completiva sin la presencia de una preposición. El marco teórico que, está, que este trabajo se centra es el programa minimalista, eh, donde buscamos y discutir la variación paramétrica en el español a fin de describir y explicar bajo la, la luz de la teoría del caso la realización de los sujetos preverbales de infinitivo en el español caribeño. Y planteamos dos hipótesis como posibles sí, explicaciones para ese fenómeno lingüístico. Eh, la primera hipótesis es de subespecificación de rasgo de caso por el, el núcleo P, con la valoración del rasgo de caso de los pronombres para las cláusulas subordinadas presentados por Carvalho 2008, eh, que vamos a discu discutir más adelante. Y, el, y la segunda hipótesis es de caso de fo nominativo para las cláusulas nominales. Entonces, la primera hipótesis, hipótesis da, 
da conta assim, de dados como 6, 6 AC, sim, cláusulas subordinadas com preposições, e a hipótese B seria para contra conta de dado como 6D. Então, é o único para ser feliz é eu ter minha casa própria, onde vemos uma oração completiva. Sobre a hipótese de subespe subespecificação de raso de caso por o núcleo P, Carvalho, em 2008, discute sobre o caso de las oraciones de infinitivo com sujeito anteposto. Segundo o investigador, a verificação do caso à luz de P em posição de sujeito em las oraciones não finitas não é assignado por um T infinitivo para as sentenças como em 7. Ela deu livro para eu ler, ela deu livro para mim ler. Segundo Carvalho, o eh, planteamento de assignação de caso por o núcleo T infinitivo apresenta certa inconsistência, seja por um elemento que assigna caso nominativo apenas em 7A, sendo 7B uma sentença idêntica, seja por a impossibilidade de generalizações de tales propostas quando contrastadas com outros exemplos. Podemos ver a configuração que seria semelhante a estas duas estruturas em la diapositiva seguinte. É, a configuração em A e B, onde o pronome é, eu, valora caso de la preposição em B, é, mi valora caso oblíquo em A, valora caso nominativo. Temos outro contraste com outras construções que passa que ocorre em, em português, sim, em Brasil. Ela deu um presente para eu, você não tinha falado com eu. Se observa em 8AB que os DPs eu aparecem despo, é, depois de uma preposição. Sim, está antes de um verbo não finito. E o rasgo de caso... Perfeito. E o rasgo de caso nominativo é verificado. Assim, Carvalho enfatiza que a presença de la forma pronominal é, eu e mi depende somente de la composicionalidade do pronome que aparece em la posição de sujeito de uma oração encajada e da e de la consequente verificação de seus rasgos. Seguindo o análise de Carvalho, 2008, planteamos uma análise similar para os DPs preverbales de cláusulas subordinadas e do espanhol do Caribe, assumindo que verificam rasgo de caso do núcleo P de la subespecificação de rasgo de caso do pronome. Então, proponemos, eh, planteamos esta hipótese para eh, orações como 6 a C. Sobre o caso de Fossi, eh, Schultz eh, diz sí, que faz parte da gramática universal a fim de explorar suas consequências para o sistema de caso morfológico e sua relação com o caso abstrato. O que podemos eh, tomar sobre o caso de Fossi é que as formas de caso de Fossi são usadas para DPs pronunciados que não estão associados a nenhum recurso de assignação de caso ou de outra forma determinado por mecanismos sintáticos, que é o análise sí, que planteamos para orações como 10. Então, o único para ser feliz é eu ter minha própria, é eu ter, perdão, minha casa própria. Planteamos que o DP eu, com forma nominativa, marca caso de for uma vez que não há nenhum núcleo verificador de caso, como a preposição e o núcleo I. Eh, para corroborar se a essa hipótese, eh, apresentamos Viot 2005, que mostra que pronomes coordenados complementos de algumas preposições em espanhol aparecem em forma nominativa, ao revés de pronomes complementos de preposição não coordenados como em 11, e são marcados também com o caso de FO. Observamos. Hicimos o trabalho entre tu e eu, hicimos o trabalho entre ti e mim como uma oração agramatical. 
Sobre el corpus y la metodología, seguimos con el análisis lingüístico a través de un corpus específico, el proyecto para el estudio sociolingüístico del español de España y de América, PRESEA. Analizamos datos de dos ciudades, La Habana, Cuba y Caracas, Venezuela. Separamos las oraciones con sujetos preverbales, identificamos los tipos de oraciones subordinadas y completivas, identificamos las preposiciones que aparecen con sujetos preverbal, identificamos el tipo de sujeto, si es pronominal o nominal, como encontramos, y sobre los criterios sociolingüísticos, analizamos datos de hablantes de escolaridad baja y media con los grupos de edades entre 24 y 74 años. Las consideraciones finales, la propuesta de Carvalho 2008 puede ser usada para explicar el sujeto antepuesto a las oraciones no finitas en el español caribeño, una vez que se plantea que el caso es un rasgo. El DP valora el caso del núcleo P a preposición. Así, la información del rasgo de concordancia y tiempo en el infinitivo no sería necesaria para la valoración perdón, del rasgo de caso al sujeto preverbal de las cláusulas definitivas. Este trabajo en el nivel más amplio ratifica la gran diversidad lingüística presente en el español caribeño que se configura por sí solo como una variedad distinta a las demás variedades del español y en el nivel más específico se intenta explicar cómo se da la realización de un determinado fenómeno lingüístico en el español del Caribe. Ese trabajo, sin embargo, no representa un cierre sobre el fenómeno, el fenómeno de los sujetos depuestos en oraciones no finitas en el C. Por lo contrario, partimos de una hipótesis previa y trabajamos a fin de comprobarlas a través de un corpus específico. Acreditamos que esta investigación servirá para trabajos futuros y que, consecuentemente, la discusión sobre los sujetos preverbales de las oraciones no finitas podrá ser más bien refinada. Cinco minutos. Aquí están las referencias. Muy obrigado, muchas gracias. Creo que ahora podemos pasar a la sesión de preguntas y comentarios. Hola Alberto, gracias por tu ponencia. Um, yo solo quería um, remarcar que en español también existen los sujetos um, de infinitivo antepuesto con sin uh, o sin darme cuenta. Es completamente aceptable en todas las variedades del español que conozco. O sea que me parece que una parte de los sujetos antepuestos puede que no sean específicos al español uh, caribeño. Y también hay un libro de Guido Mensching del 97 sobre uh, los sujetos, los, los infinitivos con sujetos en las lenguas romances, porque es un, es un fenómeno mucho más um, común en las lenguas románicas que, por ejemplo, en las lenguas germánicas. Bueno, gracias. Eh, muchas gracias por vuestra contribución. Eh, eh, estoy en el doctorado, eh, sigo con la investigación de este fenómeno lingüístico, pero lo voy a hacer de manera más aprofundizada. Incluso tomé nota de esa referencia para que yo pueda más allá buscarla y aprofund eh, aprofundizar si la, la teoría, el análisis... Eh, de manera más efectiva. Gracias, Albert. Um, más, uh -huh. sí, adelante, por favor. Uh -huh. pues, eh, muchas gracias por tu presentación, Albert. Eh, yo quería hacer un conjunto de observaciones, unas sobre los datos, otras de carácter teórico. Eh, lo, eh, lo que te señala Patricia es muy importante, y, pero hay la ventaja de que en muchos casos se remite al pronombre de primera persona singular yo. Eh, las cláusulas no finitas 
en básicamente todas las variantes del español permiten eh, el sujeto no finito preverbal siempre que sea yo. Esa oración que tenías eh, para yo preparar el pastel es perfecta en español de México. Eh, pero se sale uno de yo y ya no es lo mismo. Eh, el fenómeno es complejo, no sé si entendemos por qué, pero descriptivamente el pronombre de primera persona singular aparece en esa posición en muchas cláusulas no finitas de, del español. Y luego re, respecto al análisis, eh, había un análisis muy parecido en los años noventas eh, en el marco de reacción y ligamiento. No recuerdo si lo hizo María Luisa Hernández o este, José María Brucar. Y está muy en la línea de los demás análisis que enlistaste posteriormente. Pero hay otro conjunto de análisis que lo que plantean es que los sujetos preverbales de las cláusulas de infinitivo en las variantes caribeñas se encuentran en esa posición por cuestiones de estructura informativa. Característicamente son tópicos y yo diría más específicamente tópicos de contraste. Eh, yo tengo un trabajo sobre eso en caso de que sea de tu interés. Eh, ¿Cuál es el problema? El problema es que si uno hace un conteo de la frecuencia de los sujetos léxicos en las cláusulas de infinitivo, incluso en las variantes caribeñas, la enorme mayoría aparecen después del verbo, igual que digamos en el español de México o en el español de España. Y eso hace pensar que efectivamente esa no es la situación, que la situación del sujeto preverbal no es la situación no marcada que sería resultado de la asignación de caso sino que más bien es una situación muy marcada que tiene que ver con las propiedades informativas del sujeto y bajo otras circunstancias, cuando no se dan esas consideraciones informativas, la mayoría de los sujetos léxicos de las cláusulas de infinitivo aparecen en posición posverbal. Entonces, quizás querrías revisar algunos de estos análisis orientados a, a, la, a la estructura de la información porque es, es un contraste muy fuerte. Si, si fuera la situación no marcada, eh, encontrar el sujeto en la posición preverbal tendría mucho sentido plantear que es un, es un proceso de asignación de caso, como en lenguas de orden más fijo como el inglés, pero en realidad no lo es tanto. Muchas gracias. Y y, y todavía nos queda un poco de tiempo para más preguntas y comentarios. Uh -huh. ah. <risa> Adelante. Perdón, solo un comentario. Este. Muchos saludos a Carlos Felipe. Que me esté mejor muy pronto. Uh -huh. Le paso bien? la saludos. ¿Mm? A ver si... Ajá. Renato, sí. Hola Alberto, muchas gracias por tu presentación. Yo solo tengo una pregunta muy sencilla. Estás presentando en español, ¿verdad? Sí. Eh, eh, en el caso del de ejemplo que donde tenías, que es lo único necesario para ser feliz es yo tener mi propia casa, lo que me preguntaba es, o sea, si, si en las situaciones en las que tienes un verbo, bueno, perdón, una cláusula no finita y tienes una preposición, ¿no? previa, ¿por qué? ¿Por qué tendrías, por qué en, en la primera parte la preposición permitiría que hubiera un pro grande y en la segunda parte del, de la cópula que haya un sujeto léxico? Es mi pregunta. Según, bueno, según tu, tu, lo que nos presentas. Gracias. Bueno, ¿puede repetir nuevamente la pregunta, por favor? Ay, perdón, el ejemplo es 6 de Sí. Lo que me pregunto es por qué la preposición para permite que inmediatamente después venga un pro grande, ser feliz, y después el yo aparezca después del, de la cópula. Es decir, cómo dan cuenta de eso en su análisis. 
Bueno, eh, básicamente eh, esas construcciones cuando no aparece el sujeto sin posición preverbal y ahí se marca con un pro grande, eh, muchas veces está vinculada por la cuestión de barreras y ¿sí? para la cuestión de violación, tenemos ahí una barrera CP y P, pero eh, en este caso, eh, justamente lo que intento, estoy intentando analizar es eh, justamente la anteposición de ese sujeto eh, en posición pre preverbal, porque muchas de las veces cuando tenemos ahí un CP, una partícula que el verbo eh, automáticamente pasa para el modo subjuntivo y no para el modo infinitivo. No sé si entendí bien su pregunta, si era básicamente eh, sobre eso, eh, pero lo que comprendí, eh, eh, una, explic una explicación posible sería, sería esa. Muy bien, y todavía tenemos tiempo para una preguntita más. Uh -huh. eh. A ver si no. Uh -huh. Entonces sería todo por el momento. Albert, le agradecemos por, por su tiempo, por su exposición y por esta increíble ponencia. Muchas gracias, Albert. Gracias. Saludos desde Brasil. Y ahora podemos pasar a la siguiente ponencia a cargo de Samantha de Serracita de LLING. Universidad de Nantes, Francia, y el título de su ponencia es What answers the negative polar questions tell us in romance? Um, Samantha, welcome to the third conference of formal linguistics in Mexico. We're delighted to see you. The floor is yours. You may start in 10 seconds. Microphone. Uh, Samantha, I, I'm sorry, you need to turn on uh, your, your microphone. Unfortunately, we can't hear you right now. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so good morning to everyone and thanks for being here and thanks for making this possible. So today I'm going to present uh, what answers to negative polar questions tell us. In particular, we would see examples of Roman languages and how can we account for the different behaviors that we will present. So the objective of this presentation is to look at the answers to negative polar questions to determine the locus interpretation of negation. To do so, we will look at polar response particles to negative polar questions in three languages, which would be Gallo, French uh, from France and Spanish. The three diagnostic put forth here were developed following Holmberg, 2015, and we thus assume a three syntactic positions for negation, which would be low, middle, and high. Now, low negation would be below TP, while middle and high negation would be above TP, and we would see this in the second part of the presentation. We also take in consideration that negative polar questions with middle and high negation are biased, this following Ladd, Romero, and Anne, and Holmberg. And those negative polar questions with high negation would all check a positive proposition, and a negative polar question with middle negation would check a negative proposition. So all of this we will see in more detail in what follows. And now recall that we are contrasting Spanish, French from France, and Gallo. So let me start by giving a brief introduction of uh, Gallo. So Gallo is an endangered regional language of France known as the Roman language of Brittany. It belongs to the oil family and it is spoken in the in Upper Brittany, Lower Normandy and Maine. Nowadays, it is spoken in Plouha, Rouen and Morbihan. 
It was used by Breton speakers to refer to foreigners of French. Uh, one important detail is that this language is uh, comes from the Roman language family and not from the Celtic language. Now let us begin with the neck diagnostic proposed. So I would skip this slide so we can see each one in detail. So languages have no negation when the positive response particle yes confirms not P while the negative response particle no asserts P through a double negation. So in other words, it confirms a positive proposition as there are two negations that cancel each other out. And one from the negative polar particle and another one from the negative proposition. In addition to build our negative polar questions with low negation, we use the adverb, we use an adverb. This is uh, because we follow Holmberg, who demonstrates that it forces negation to be interpreted in the lower position. So in this case, we will use the adverb typically. Now, this can be seen in example one with the question, do cats typically not like rotten food? The different answers are given in, two, in English and three in French. So as we can see concerning the positive response particle, yes cannot assert that P is true, but it confirms that not P is true. In contrast, the negative response particle no asserts P by means of a double negation. Now notice that the same pattern of answer is given in French. We assert that the negative proposition is true, but cannot assert that P is true. Namely, we is saying cats typically don't like rotten food. So to assert P, they use non, which again, through a double negation, we have the meaning cats typically like rotten food. So in this case, both English and French have low negation. Now let us see what happened with Gallo. So here again, we have our negative polar question with the adverb de coutum, forcing negation to be lower. The question is does ton chat y mange qui point du pâté de coutum? This pattern of answer given by the consultant is showing four. Ver, which is yes in Gallo, cannot assert P or not P. To assert P, they use a the reversal particle SIA. And to assert not P, they use the negative response particle NUNA. As we can notice, the interpretation of NUNA is of negative concord. Namely, when multiple morphological negations are interpreted as one semantic negation. Notice that this is not the pattern of answer of low negation. Now, uh, oops, we can also see what happened in Spanish. So Spanish presents two difficulties. The first is that very yes and the reversal particle are homophonous. So both are C. As we will see, this will limit us a little as we will not be able to distinguish them. The second difficulty is that the adverb a veces can be spelled out in different syntactic position. Therefore, we cannot assume that it is forcing negation to be interpreted lower. This is shown in example four and five. Here, answering C asserts P. And answering no as it's not P with a negative concord interpretation. But again, we don't know if that C is a verse C or a reversal C. Interestingly, when responding an assertion where the negative response, where the negative proposition is embedded in a rising verb, no negation seems to be present in Spanish as shown in six, which parece que Juan no llegará a tiempo. So answering with this polar response particle C asserts not P while answering with no asserts P again by means of a double negation. So for the time being, we can assume that Spanish has the possibility of interpreted low negation in the low position. So up to now, we have shown that Spanish and French have low negation, but Gallo hasn't. Now let us move on to middle and high negation. So pre -post negation in English show bias. So a question such as six, isn't Jane coming, can be used in two different contexts. We refer to those contexts as PPI context and MPI context. So let us start reading the PPI context in seven. So A says, okay, now that Stephen has come, we are all here, let's go. And B answered, isn't Jane coming too? So neg negative polar questions with high negation are questions where the speaker conveys an expectation toward a positive answer as it is trying to confirm or double check the positive proposition P. In this case, that Jane is coming. In addition, we add the positive polarity item two to force negation to be interpreted in the higher position. Now, if we look at the MPI context in eight, the scenario says, uh, Pat and Jane are two phonologists who are supposed to be speaking on optimality and acquisition. So A says Pat is not coming. So we don't have any phonologists in the program. 
and B response isn't Jane coming either. So here we have a negative polar question with middle negation, where the speaker wants to double check the negative proposition that Jane is not coming. Here again, we add uh, another item, which is a negative polarity item either, to force negation to be interpreted in the middle position. As we will see in the following part, each context has different pattern of answers, which is what is interesting for us. So let us begin with middle negation. So languages have middle negation when no agrees with the negative proposition and yes cannot be there. So either languages uses extended yes as English or reversal particle as in French. So we built our negative polar question with an API to force negation to be interpreted in the middle position. And we add a context where the speaker is double checking not P. This is shown in nine. So the API context says, Ali and Sabrina are two phonologists who will present at the verbal language conference. A says, Ali is not coming, so we don't have any phonologists in the program. And B then asks, isn't Sabrina coming either? As we can notice, English use the extended yes in 10C, while French uses the reversal particle C in 11C. Unfortunately, we cannot distinguish in Spanish because I, as I said before, the reversal C from the verse C uh, are homophonous. So we cannot conclude whether negation is being interpreted in the middle position or not. However, all the three languages have a negative concord reading when answering no. So now, uh, at least English and French, we know that they are, have been, negation is interpreted in the, in the middle position. So now let us see what happened in Gallo. So here again, we built our negative polar question with middle negation in an MPI context as shown in 13. Our question then is in 13C, la Sabrina et bien point non plus. As we can see, there is not possible to affirm P or not P as shown in 14A. Gallo just as French uses a reversal particle answer Sia. So dam, it's like an interjection and Sia, it's the reversal particle saying, the positive proposition, asserting the positive proposition. And then the negative polar response Nuna have a negative concord interpretation. So just as expected, Gallo has middle negation as French or English. Now let us finish with the high negative diagnostic. So here, here again, we need a PPI context. This means that our negative polar question will include a positive polarity item to force negation to be interpreted higher. In addition, the context was video, so the speaker double checks the positive proposition. So in the PPI context, it says, okay, now that Stephen has come, we are all here, let's go. And be asked, isn't Jane coming too? So languages have high negation when a very yes is possible as a pre-jacent clause is positive. Thus, yes confirms the positive proposition that Jane is coming, which is a case of English. And that is why you don't need, we don't need the extended answer. And then the negative response particle no reverses the polarity of that positive proposition. So in other words, it is negating P that chain is coming. This is shown in 16. Spanish again presents the same difficulty as very yes and the reversal particle are homophonous. So again, we cannot reject or confirm that it's been interpreted in the higher position. Now, uh, I would move on to Gallo and then to Standard French from France because they both present different and similar behaviors. So here again, the speaker conveys an expectation as it is trying to double check the positive proposition P that Jane is coming. In addition, we propose to include the PPI E2 also. So the question would be in 18B, la Jane, et bien pas E2. Here it is important to point out that our informant said that he accepted it marginally, but he won't produce it. And if he would, he would prefer to add the MPI non plus. So that was the first hint we had. Then interestingly, we look at the pattern of answers and there yes, which is there, is not possible to affirm P or to affirm not P. They use the reversal particle C again, suggesting that there is a negation somewhere that, that would be reversed. So we have those the pattern of answer of middle negation and not of high negation. Now let us finish this part by showing what happened with French from France. So here again, the speaker wants to double check the positive proposition, P that Jane is coming. 
So we have our negative polar question in 17B, which is Jane, maybe on PA OC. So OC it's our PPI. So what found it's, is a dialect split. The first dialect behaves as English, namely we asserts that the positive proposition is true while none asserts that the positive proposition is false, so just as expected. But the second dialect behaves as Gallo. So we is not possible. And what they use is the reversal particle C. It is important to point, point out that this particular behavior concerns high negation only and that the informants were in the Northeast of France. So it's not like a generalization of, of everyone in France. So dialect one behave as English, namely where we is asserting P while dialect two uses the reversal particle C to assert P just as Gallo. So to sum up, we have shown that by using the answer particles to negative polar questions, we can know where negation is. Holmberg's typology states that there are languages like English, which is a mixed language that has high, middle, and low negation. He also says that languages can have high and middle negation, but not low negation, and they can have low, but not high and middle. So we propose to add two languages types, one where there is middle negation only as Gallo, and the other one where there is middle and low, but not high as the standard French dialect too. Now, the questions that have arisen are, why does not Gallo have low negation? And why don't either Gallo or standard French dialect too have high negation? So in this part, I will briefly show the analysis we have proposed. As said before, following Homer, we assume that there are three positions for the locus and interpretation of negation. Low negation would be inside the TP and middle and high negation would be above the TP. Concerning the response particle, we assume that they are generated as a head of, of a polarity phrase, so taking TP as its complement. And following Pasquero, we replace neg P for sigma P to represent that TP ranges over affirmative or negative propositions. So this can give us our positive or negative bias. Now let us start with low negation. So recall that for low negation, answering yes confirms not P while answering no asserts not P by means of a double negation. Having a double negation suggests that we have two semantic negations in the structure. Thus the prejacent clause contains a negation below TP as shown in 23 and 24. In 23, yes will confirm that prejacent clause containing negation while in 24, no will create a double negation as we have two, uh, let's say semantic negations. So now our question was, why does Ngalo have low negation? So just uh, in previous work, we have showed that networks in Gallo are not intrinsically negative and as such, they carry an uninterpretable negative feature that would be licensed by a cover negative operator. So an argument of this is shown in 25 where the network personne and point uh, both appear together in a yes no question on a non-negative reading. So another argument that we, I didn't put, but that also concerns is the lack of double negation because it supports that morphological negation is not intrinsically negative in this language. In this case, multiple morphological negations appear and are interpreted as one semantic negation. And all this is through, by means of this covered negative operator. So now let us see how this goes with our analysis. So with this in mind, we propose that the lack of double negation interpretation of the negative response particle Nuna is due to the fact that both Nuna and Poing are intrinsically non-negative and thus they need to be licensed by a covert negative operator. This is shown in the structure in 25 and 26. So in 25, we have a negative comfort reading as the covert uh, operator is licensing the uninterpretable feature from Nuna and from Poin. Now, what happened in 26? Well, if Poin is licensed by a cover negative operator in the specifier of Poin P, we would have a future clash with the positive response answer there. Now, recall that we use a reversal particle CIA to assert P. This tells us that Poin is licensed by a cover negative operator and that CIA appears to reverse its polarity. So what we are suggesting is that very is not possible because it would be a future clash. And what happened is that Poin triggers its cover negative operator to, to self-license. And because there is 
that cover negative operator, the reversal particle appears to reverse its meaning. And so we have uh, the positive uh, proposition. Now, what about middle and high negation? So recall that middle negation, middle negation double check not P while high negation double checks P. We follow Romero and Anne Verum hypothesis to account for this scopal ambiguity. Verum is a conversational epistemic operator expressing that P or not P should be added to the common ground. This author uses it to account for the fact that the speaker is double checking P or not P. In other words, that the prejacent of the question is P or not P. So this is scopal ambiguity is shown in 27. Now let us end by accounting for the lack of high negation in Gallo standard French dialect too. So we will start reviewing negation, middle negation as English and Gallo has it. As we can see, the morphological negation is below the verbal operator. In the case of English, it is intrinsically negative and does license the MPI. In contrast, in Gallo, there is a covert negative operator licensing both point and uh, the MPI. So what is important in these cases is that the verum operator is above the negation. And so we have this proposition that has the negative bias that we were looking for when we have middle negation. Now, let us look at high negation. So as we can see, English negation would be generated above Verum. So this accounts for the positive bias as the prejacent has no longer negation. In addition, Verum would shield the PPI, which explains why when a PPI is used in a negative polar question, it is not ungrammatical. Now, what happened with Gallo? Oh, wait. So here we propose that while it is copy for the answer is a propositional content of the question, which do not include the verum operator. Thus, our yes will confirm that the prejacent copy, which is the square box holds. So what is important is that we don't have negation now in the prejacent. Now, what happened with Gallo? Recall that poem behaves like an MPI as it needs to be licensed by a semantic negation, which in this language is a cover negative operator. In the case of the negative polar question with high negation, negation is generated above verum, which again allows the projection to be a positive proposition. So what we believe that happen is that the negative operator indeed goes above verum, but because verum means there, it, can, it cannot license the uninterpretable negative feature of one. So, now for the answers here again, if we copy only the propositional content, content which is below verum, then point will not be licensed. However, as Nuna self license it will license point two, which is a prejacent. So that is why Nuna, we don't know. Well, we believe that it's not of high negation, but it's of middle negation. Anyway, now answering very is not possible as here again, we will have a feature class just as we saw with negation in figure 26. So our conclusions are the following. These diagnostics help us to know the locus and interpretation of negation. For instance, they have shown that Gallo's negation cannot be interpreted above TP. In addition, it has also shown that negation is not, in, not interpreted that low and or that they are morphologically negative that needs to be licensed by a covert negative operator. Standard French from France seems to have a dialect split. So one dialect which behaves as English while the other dialect behaves as Gallo with respect to middle and low negation. And finally, the difference between the languages presented here can be derived cross-linguistically from the setting of two parameters, whether morphological negation and negative response particle each contributes to semantic negation. And thank you. So, Reference, thank you. <laughs> I cannot hear. Yeah, I cannot hear.
<laughs> I cannot listen. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> ¿Cómo lo vamos a hacer? Ya, yeah, I can listen. Uh, yeah, I can yeah. listen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, now let me see any any questions, comments, suggestions. Anyone? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. It seems that the presentation was was uh, really clear and in this case samantha yeah. i guess that would be all for for the time being thank you in spite of all the technical difficulties i think that we managed to do uh, what you managed to do a really good job so thank you and we congratulations all, we all. Once <laughs> thank again. you thank you thank you thank you bueno <laughs> Sí, muy bien. Uh, en este caso concluimos el segundo bloque de, de la sesión matutina del día de hoy y ahora podemos tomarnos un pequeño descanso y nos veremos aquí a las 12.15. Uh -huh. Gracias. Uh, parece que sí hay una pregunta, una, una disculpa. Eh, Samantha, ¿estás ahí? ¿Estás ahí? Samantha. Sí, estoy. Estoy. Sí. Ah, ok. So we've got a question here. Let me find it. And hay una pregunta. Eh, in, uh, uh -huh. que, ajá. Eh, yo quería saber sobre la identidad dialectal de los hablantes de español que juzgaron. Uh, isn't Jane coming to? Uh, uh, I, I'm sure that you. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. I, I thought well, well, that Jane was some, someone else. Uh, yeah. then, uh, <laughs> my mistake. In this case, uh, uh, identidad dialectal de los hablantes de español que juzgaron. Uh, could, uh, yes, and the, 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 the sentence in question is. Isn't Jane coming too? Maybe you could expand on that. Uh, bueno, yeah, I would say in Spanish, okay? Sorry, it was yeah, a question. Okay. I, I wrote it as uh, she, get, she wouldn't, when she wasn't here and hearing us. So um, oh. I wanted to know the dialectal identity of the Spanish speakers who judged with a uh, double question mark uh the affirmative oh, question okay. of isn't jane coming too okay because to me it's perfectly acceptable to say yes and if i recall correctly you you signal it with double uh double yeah. question marks uh, that, uh, yeah i can answer in spanish if you want yeah. so, <laughs> it's, it's, la, <laughs> okay lo que pasa es que como tenemos, no hay reversal sí, solo tenemos un sí, entonces no podemos hacer la distinción entre si es el sí que afirma P o el sí que está haciendo que la proposición 
que es negativa cambia a ser positiva. Entonces, por eso puse los dos question mark, los dos interrogativos. La única diferencia que hubo, o sea, mis informantes eran de México, no eran muchos, ¿no? <risa> Pero eran de México, de Bolivia y de Colombia. Y la única diferencia que realmente hubo es que la gente de Bolivia, o sea, mis dos o tres amigos de Bolivia, cuando responden sí en una pregunta que tiene negación baja, sí están confirmando la negación. Entonces, si sí pregunto, ¿no has comido? O sea, ¿no, ¿no has comido todavía? Pues ellos responden sí y es sí, no he comido. Y yo, en mi español de México, es sí, sí he comido. Entonces, creo que hace falta que busque cómo diferenciarlos. Ahora también hay otras cosas que han pasado como que hay, por ejemplo, en francés responden dos veces sí, sí, sí. Y en español a veces dice sí, sí, sí he comido como para confirmar. Entonces tendría que ver qué significa eso. Y el más interesante que yo digo es que digo, no, sí he comido. O sea, estoy negando o estoy afirmando. Pero sobre todo el objetivo principal cuando empecé a hacer esta investigación era como revisar en dónde estábamos interpretando la negación porque la negación puede aparecer en un lugar, pero en realidad su interpretación puede estar más arriba. Y ha habido estudios que lo muestran con los intervention effects y es por eso que han postulado que está este operador que no importa dónde esté la negación, aparece lo más arriba que pueda y entonces legitimiza. Y ya. Muchas gracias, Amanda. De nada. Uh, ¿Más preguntas? No. En este caso, sí. Eh, ahora sí concluimos este, este bloque y sí vamos a tomarnos un pequeño descanso y como les comenté anteriormente, nos veremos aquí a las 12.15. Samantha, le agradecemos por su intervención. Felicidades. Gracias, gracias.
Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Maxim Barkov y tendré el gusto de moderar la, el tercer bloque de la sesión matutina del segundo día del tercer encuentro de lingüística formal. Uh, uh, perdón. <risa> Uh, tendré el gusto de moderar la sesión matutina, eh, el tercer bloque de la sesión matutina eh, del segundo día del tercer encuentro de lingüística formal en México. Ahora entiendo. Uh, les hago, uh, les doy la más cordial bienvenida y les hago llegar un saludo afectuoso desde el auditorio Rosario Castellanos en Alt México que podrán enviarnos sus preguntas en la caja de comentarios de YouTube a lo largo de esta transmisión. Recordamos que a cada ponente se le otorgará 20 minutos para presentar su trabajo y luego podremos pasar a la sesión de preguntas y comentarios. También se les informará sobre el tiempo restante de su ponencia 10 y 5 minutos antes de, del final de su presentación. Sin más preámbulo, le cedo la palabra a... Francisco Antonio Montaño, del Colegio Lehman, de la Universidad de la Ciudad de Nueva York, Estados Unidos, y el título de su ponencia es Reframing the Numeric Analysis of All French Coda Estilation as the Culmination of Syllable Concept Tanks. Uh, Francisco, al pasar 10 segundos, usted podrá comenzar. Bienvenido. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes a todos. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for having me and for coming to my talk today. Uh, my study reframes a well-known Mareic analysis to the deletion of coda sibilants in Old French, as in Guest 1998, 1999, and later work. In this paper, I re-examine Old French coda S deletion, which was accompanied by compensatory lengthening in the preceding vowel. Synchronic details and related phenomena suggest moral licensing constraints may have arisen as the culmination of a broader diachronic trend of progressively stricter syllable contact constraints, thus further contextualizing the process diachronically and yielding implications for synchronic phenomena, such as the prothesis of word initial SC clusters. Over the course of Old French, most syllable final consonants are lost word internally, including coda sibilants, nasals, laterals, and in some dialects, R. Randall Guess's work on these coda loss phenomena argues for a sonority graded chronology with sibilants deleting first in a staggered progression to nasals L and then R. Glossing over the finer details, Guess's constraint-based account hinges on progressively stricter moral licensing constraints with a high ranking bimoriosity constraint producing the compensatory lengthening effect upon deletion. Old French coda loss thus targets codas of greater and greater sonority while forming a more general trend after the earlier Gallo romance loss of coda obstruents via several processes, including gemination, then degemination, palatalization, and deletion in unsyllabifiable triconsonantal clusters produced by late Latin syncope. Old French coda S deletion began around the 11th century and completed in the 13th century, with the earlier 11th to 12th century stage deleting voiced Z before L, a nasal or a voiced obstruent, and a second stage completed in the 13th century deleting voiceless S before voiceless obstruents. The Moraic analysis implies that Amora couldn't dominate a voiced sibilant in stage one and then separately banned a Moraic voiceless S in stage two. But there are details that don't fully align with a purely Moraic analysis. For example, words exhibiting prothesis of etymological word initial SC didn't show compensatory lengthening. A need to be in stressed position doesn't seem to explain the lack of vowel lengthening either, as shown in words such as blamer, meler, but also in numerous monomorphemes. The diachrony of prothesis thus raises questions for the Moraic analysis. In earlier Old French, the prophetic vowel was inserted post-lexically when not preceded by a vowel final word. But around the 12th century, close to the time of coda S deletion, the prophetic vowel became a fixed element of these words, suggesting the process was now occurring at the lexical level, with the vowel presumably stabilizing into the underlying form shortly thereafter. But under a Moraic analysis, lengthening would be expected if the prophetic vowel had become part of the underlying form, since the deletion of S was occurring in a word internal Moraic position. Alternatively, if the vowel was not underlying, S is not in a Moraic position and thus it shouldn't be a target for deletion. 
The next clue comes from the ordering of the two stages. A Moraic analysis targeting Moraic Z but not S in stage one would presumably rank a constraint star Mora Z above faith in one diachronic stage with a second constraint targeting Moraic S promoted in stage two. The chronology runs counter to the sonority relation expected between voiceless and voiced counterparts of the same segment, with the latter generally being more sonorous than the former. One would thus expect star Mora S to universally outrank star Mora Z but a Moraic analysis accounting for the two-stage diachronic process would presumably have to posit the opposite ranking. Finally, S and Z were allophones of one another in coda position, a well-accepted property of Old French. There are no minimal pairs to my knowledge in word internal syllable final position, as noted by guests when citing Middle English borrowings from Old French as evidence for the two stages of coda S deletion. And so to formalize the well-evidenced differentiation between Z and S allophones as targets for deletion likely necessitates a multi-tier lexical phonology that serially selects the voiced allophone and subsequently evaluates its acceptability as Moraic. While of course it's reasonable in a larger theoretical sense, is it necessary? I argue for the two-stage two chronology of coda S deletion to instead fall out from syllable contact constraints, which can select the right target for deletion in a single tier lexical phonology. Syllable contact requirements consider the degree of son sonority contour rise or fall across syllables. In this case, specifically the sonority of a coda in relation to the sonority of the following onset. A wealth of phonological and typological knowledge supports that the ideal syllable contact is maximally falling in sonority, from a high sonority coda like a liquid to a low sonority onset like a voiceless stop. In coda S deletion, however, we only have a fall in sonority before an obstruent. By looking at syllable contact instead of the moraic viability of just the coda, the Z allophone deletes earlier because ZL and Z nasal sonority contours are rising instead of falling, with Z voiced obstruent being a near flat sonority. Before a voiceless stop, S is tolerated until stage two because this represents minimal but sufficient falling sonority and syllable contact. Just as admissible coda consonants for Moraic association are universally ranked in order of increasing sonority, acceptable syllable contact clusters beginning with a sibilant would be ranked in order of decreasing sonority for the onset, as a less sonorous onset would produce a greater sonority fall. The onsets following deleted coda S in stage one thus form a natural class of onsets with sonority greater than a voiceless obstruent. By stage two, the sonority fall from the sibilant to the voiceless obstruent is no longer sufficient to be harmonic, and so deletion applies to the coda sibilant in these clusters as well. There's evidence within the early history of French that syllable contact constraints play an active role in the shaping of the language's phonological structure. When late Latin and early Gallo-Romance syncope grouped consonants into clusters that violated well-formedness, a diverse array of phonological repairs applied. Of primary concern here is the repair mechanism of stop epenthesis, affecting word medial clusters consisting of a sibilant or a sonorant followed by a liquid. Textual evidence of Gallo-Romance stop epenthesis appears in the earliest 19th, sorry, earliest 9th century texts. I focus here on sibilant rhotic clusters shown in A, which insert a stop homorganic with the coda sibilant. The generalization for Gallo-Romance stop epenthesis is that the input consonants stranded by syncope were not well-formed onset clusters, requiring them to surface heterosyllabically. Yet, given their rising sonority, they also yield a poor syllable contact. By creating a sonority valley in the form of a minimally invasive stop drawing most features from the preceding input segment, the repair achieves a falling son sonority syllable contact and the preservation of both input segments. Adding this to our syllable contact scale from before, a more general diachronic trend involving ever stricter syllable contact constraints comes into view. The diachronic constraint-based analysis I'll now present formalizes this progression in syllable contact requirements as a precursor to a more total ban on coda sibilance that could be enforced by more licensing constraints such as star mora s by later Old French. My formal analysis relies on Birch and Davis's split margin approach, particularly well suited to evaluating the relative harmony of sonority contours in both onset and syllable contact clusters and within a single framework. What makes S SL, for example, a poor syllable contact in stage one needs to be evaluated alongside its unacceptability as an onset cluster, despite rising sonority. 
To provide a very brief summary of the split margin approach, it identifies an inner and outer margin of the syllable, identified as M1 and M2, conforming to the well-established generalization that outer margins prefer low sonority and inner margins prefer high sonority. Via local conjunction within the domain of the syllable, conjoined constraints evaluate syllable internal clusters like onset clusters, for which a maximal sonority rise is most harmonic and a falling sonority is least harmonic. Syllable contact clusters bring together an M2 segment and an M1 in the following syllable, and they occur within the word domain. Given M2's preference for high sonority and M1's for low sonority, this formalizes the generalization that the optimal syllable contact cluster falls maximally in sonority across the syllable boundary. Again, via local conjunction, but now within the word domain, we obtain a hierarchy of the relative markedness of syllable contact clusters. A note on nomenclature. These constraints first name the M1 and the M2, even though in a syllable contact cluster, these two elements appear in the opposite order. This is to highlight the implicational ranking between constraints in subordinate and superordinate to prosodic domains. The acceptability of a particular onset cluster generally implies the acceptability of the same reverse order or mirror image syllable contact cluster. Returning to our schema of SC syllable contact clusters, it's easily recast in terms of word level split margin constraints. As the framework acknowledges the need for further subdivisions within each sonority tier on a language specific basis, when it's phonetically and empirically justified, I separate out sibilance from other obstruents and voiced from voiceless obstruents in my modeling of early French based on the data we've seen. Viewed differently, the relative harmonity, the, excuse me, the relative harmony of SC syllable contact clusters looks something like the following on the expanded hierarchy of word level split margin constraints, starting with stop apenthesis in Gallo Romance and followed by ever stricter syllable contact requirements by Old French stage one and then stage two. My more detailed OT analysis first looks at Gallo Romance stop apenthesis, informed by contemporary processes such as prothesis, which contextualizes the split margin constraints in the broader phonological system. Ongoing prothesis shows that although deletion is the preferred repair over vowel insertion for certain unsyllabifiable clusters in late Latin and Gallo Romance, this is not true at the edge of the input string, such as word initially. As for Gallo Romance stop apenthesis more specifically, the clusters it affects implies the relevance of the following syllable domain split margin constraints and the following word domain constraints, with depth C penalizing consonant insertion falling between clusters that exhibit stop apenthesis and those that do not. A curious question that arises from the split margin hierarchy is why SL clusters don't undergo any repair when they are supposedly less harmonic than clusters like nasal lateral and LR that do. I'm gonna get back to that very shortly. Some other details informing my analysis, the epithetic stop is always- Nine minutes. Sorry, 10 minutes? Yes? Okay, um, thank you. The epithetic stop is always homorganic with the first segment, implying a high ranking depth place constraint. And I also posit a high ranking syncope constraint as a shorthand for the many details of this stress related phenomenon. Some final details, given deletion is not the selected repair for these clusters as is the case for other unsyllabifiable clusters, max must outrank the word level split margin constraints and depth C. Finally, numerous lexical examples confirm that SN and S obstruent clusters remain acceptable in Gallo Romance, and thus those split margin constraints rank below depth C. Putting this all together, we get a constraint hierarchy that looks something like this, incorporating the split margin constraints and the ordering of faithfulness constraints as discussed. When considering the unharmonic syllable contact clusters affected by stop, Gallo Romance stop apenthesis, we see that the process represents the optimal repair and minimal violation, as shown in these tableau. I want to focus on the SR example. The positioning of the relevant faith constraint amongst split margin constraints here yields the attested outcome for this cluster. Returning shortly to the question of SL, even though the split margin constraint ranking implies it would, it would trigger stop apenthesis, it surfaces faithfully until Old French. The reason is that apenthesizing SL would run against a cross-linguistically common phonotactic restriction against TL and DL clusters, which are avoided and end up geminating in earlier Gallo romance when produced by syncope. This suggests the phonotactic constraint outranks at least max. SL clusters, while allowed to surface, 
don't represent a syllable contact sonority contour that's otherwise so harmonic, even in Gallo romance. With this ranking, the outcome's clearly, clearly in favor of not epenthesizing SL clusters, with the split margin constraint targeting it, remaining the minimal violation as star TLDL trumps depth C. By the time of old French, reverse slope rising sonority contours from coda S to, lateral, to onset laterals and nasals, as well as the near flat sonority between coda S and voiced obstruents were no longer tolerated, indicating that the relevant split margin constraints had now promoted above max. As stated before, in this analysis, I don't opt for the Moraic account of the accompanying compensatory lengthening as underlying S is still surfacing in coda position before voiceless obstruents. Furthermore, I find a high ranking by Moraicity constraint very suspect for Old French, given how commonplace light syllables are in the language. I instead propose a high ranking max root constraint for coda S deletion. Guess rejects a constraint of this type for Old French, but especially for coda nasal deletion and L vocalization, because features such as nasal and back were retained in post deletion output forms. While this may be true for those processes, which remain motivated by more nut licensing constraints, there's reason to believe that spreading to an abandoned root node could be a byproduct of the earlier syllable contact induced coda deletion, especially given that the incipient stages of coda nasal deletion and L vocalization occurred after coda S deletion began. Given Gallo Romance stop appendicis doesn't entail the abandonment of a root node, the effect of max root is not visible until the sibilant is deleting by old French. On the other hand, max root may show its relevance in earlier Gallo romance differently. When flat sonority or phonotactically illicit clusters simplify via gemination, this may be in order to satisfy a, constru like, a constraint like max root. After most coda obstruents had been eliminated over the course of Gallo romance, star mora obstruent would have been acquired as higher ranking than originally. And if it came to outrank max root, this might explain the degemination process that later applied in Gallo romance. Max root also allows an alternate analysis of later old French prothesis, once it had moved from the Pope's lexical to the lexical phonology. Although it's more abstract to posit that the prothetic vowel was not yet underlying, I propose the possibility that prothesis at the time of coda S deletion can instead be considered an opaque workaround to the illicit word initial SC cluster. With no preceding input vowel for linking the S's root node, the root node is salvaged by simple vowel insertion and thus surfaces short, while the S is deleted but is crucially not in Moraic position in this account. Max root thus accomplishes compensatory lengthening word medially because it's post vocalic while exhibiting a short vowel and output for prothesis. Some lexical variants in the 12th century and later, such as despuer versus desespuer, suggest it's not that it's at least defensible to assume that the prothetic vowel had not yet become underlying at this juncture. With max root accounting for compensatory lengthening, we can now formalize the two stage continuation of syllable contact effects resulting in S deletion in Old French. Despite having escaped stop epenthesis in Gallo Romance, this tableau shows how the promoted split margin constraint alongside the continued failure of a hypothetical epenthesis repair due to phonotactics now favors the deletion of the offending coda sibilant with max root ensuring compensatory lengthening. For coda S deletion before nasals and voiced obstruents, the differential ranking of those split margin constraints above max versus the split margin constraint referencing S voiceless obstruent ranking below max formalizes the deletion versus preservation of the sibilant at, in this stage one. In the 13th century, the split margin constraint against sibilant voiceless obstruent syllable contact clusters finally ranks above max two, enforcing S deletion in this final context, and also resulting in a more comprehensive phonological ban against coda S. By this stage, only a handful of exceptions from the learned ecclesiastic domain like esperer remain with coda S intact. Words exhibiting prothesis look a bit different given the unique way in which they meet the requirements of the constraint hierarchy. Four in old French left. stage, oh, sorry, one more time. Four minutes left. Thank you. In old French stage one, when S plus voiceless obstruent remains licit word medially, the interplay of faith constraints continues to yield a word, in a word initial prophetic vowel, turning the underlying word initial S plus obstruent cluster into a syllable contact cluster. When these are no longer tolerated by stage two, the promoted split margin constraint rules out simple vowel prothesis. 
And then this is because it creates an illicit syllable contact uh, cluster. If S must delete, the last resort for satisfying max root is to insert the only syllabifi syllabifiable segment in this position, a short vowel, to hold the root node. I thus propose that the diachrony of coda S deletion begins with syllable contact effects, but eventually graduates to take part in the Mora licensing progression. This entails the incremental promotion of split margin constraints against SC syllable contact clusters, with the seeds of this progression present in Gallo Romance and culminating in the 13th century. The result is the near total absence of S in word internal coda position throughout the lexicon. Then, as an extension on star mora obstruent banning coda obstruents in earlier Gallo Romance, the absence of S in coda position motivates upcoming generations to acquire star mora S above faith with the long vowel now reinterpreted as a moraic phenomenon. The sonority graded process continues to advance to ban nasals, laterals, and rhotics as posited by Guess. Some conclusions, while a mora licensing analysis captures the overall trend of deletion in old French codas, some finer details of how the first of these phenomena, coda S deletion, how that plays out, are missed. The syllable contact analysis, on the other hand, serves to fill in these details, and it ties coda S deletion into a broader diachronic picture already nascent in the earlier Gallo-Romance period. Finally, broad contextualization of the phenomenon via comparison with related diachronic developments preceding it, provides an enriching window into how more granular syllable contact effects may have given rise to these very iconic coda deletion processes and thus set in motion the Mora-based phenomena posited by guests. So with that, I thank you very much. Merci, gracias, thank you. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Le agradecemos a Francisco por su intervención y ahora sí podemos pasar a la sesión de preguntas y comentarios. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. ¿No? ¿Oscar? ¿Por ahí? ¿No? ¿Nadie? ¿Nos, nos animan? <laughs> uh, muy bien. En este caso, uh, uh, Francisco, I would like... Uh, Tenemos una pregunta. Sí, por favor. I just have a question about um, whether we know about the data because S is unvoiced and so SD, SD clusters in coda onset are not really expected. So I was just wondering whether there would have been assimilation or whether, because um, I would have thought these were worse than ST, for example. Yes, and you're right about that. Absolutely. So, um, in fact, uh, I, I can show quickly, um, the, there was a simulation for um, underlying SD, but um, on surface, um, let me see, play from current slide. Well, that, that doesn't show the slide quite well. Um, just one moment. I can do it um, this way. So, yes, before a voiced... Um, this actually another slide would show better. Um, yes. So before a voiced obstruent um, on surface, it's true there is um, assimilation, and so the yeah the, the syllable contact is indeed worse than s voiceless, and so that's um, in in my argument uh, that I claim that to be the reason why these exhibit deletion earlier in diachrony than before the voiceless obstruent. I don't know if I, I hope I answered your question or. Thank you. Uh, more questions, suggestions, comments? No? I don't think so. In this case, Francisco, thank you very much for this incredible presentation. What a journey it was. So we went from old <laughs> romance um, all the way through to all French. Uh, incredible. Uh, thank you for taking us on this fantastic journey. Thank you. No, th thank you so much. Y muchas gracias a todos. Pues, um, pues la presentación fue en inglés, pero espero que, que hayan podido seguirla. Muchas gracias. Sí, sí, claro que sí. Uh, gracias. Muchas gracias, Francisco. Felicidades nuevamente.
Y en este caso pasaremos a la siguiente ponencia a cargo de Rafael Minuzzi de la UNIFES Brasil y de Julio Barbosa, Universidad Estatal de Paraná, Brasil. El título de su ponencia es Preposition Driven Phrases in Brazilian Portuguese Relating non compositional Meaning and in Definiteness. Um, Rafael, Julio, bienvenidos. Nos da mucho gusto verlos por aquí y al pasar 10 segundos podrán comenzar. Creo que estamos experimentando algunos problemas técnicos. Uh, uh -huh. um, deje, déjeme ver. Uh, Julio estaba conectado y ahora no. Ajá. Uh, vamos a ver qué, qué habrá pasado y reanudamos las actividades lo más pronto posible.
Eh, estimado público, queremos informarles que en este momento estamos experimentando problemas técnicos y en cu cuanto lo resolvamos, seguimos con la tercera, uh, con la segunda ponencia del último bloque del día, de la sesión matutina del día de hoy. Muy bien. Oh, hi there. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Julio? Yes. ¿Está con nosotros? Sí, estoy. Sí, no, 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 no lo escucho. No, no lo escucho. A, a, ahora sí. Ahora sí. Sí. Perdón, uh, tu computadora se ha, se ha fallado. Qué bueno que, que esté con nosotros a pesar de, to de todas las dificultades que que se presentaron y, y recuerdo al público que Julio y Rafael eh, estarán a cargo de la presentación Preposition Driven Phrases in Brazilian Portuguese Relating Non Compositional Meaning and Indefiniteness. Uh -huh. Julio, al pasar 10 segundos, usted podrá comenzar. Está bien, gracias. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, uh, primeramente, uh, gustaría de agradecer a la Comisión eh, Organizadora de, del Encuentro de Lingüística Formal en México y los pedir uh, disculpas por no, no poder uh, participar presencialmente. Uh, uh, well, uh, I'm going to change uh, languages because I, I think it's going to be a little weird if I try to read something in English and, and speak in Spanish and, and, and think about Portuguese data. So, uh, well, so uh, I'd like to thank thank my my colleague, Rafael, who's uh, watching with us on YouTube. Yeah, he, he will be there to to answer some questions within uh, within the, the period of this presentation. So the main idea of this work is to mention uh, a set of uh, interesting data that result of both his master thesis and my PhD dissertation, where we saw that uh, there's a specific meaning um, or special meaning that can show up whenever we have uh, two nouns mediated by a preposition. So we saw that there is some sort of asymmetric behavior 
within the compounding or the phrases that are headed by the preposition de, which is uh, correlated to of in English. And uh, we saw that uh, whenever there is a definite article within this, these domains, uh, we can have sometimes non-compositional readings, such as uh, cara de pau uh, in 1A, uh, which can translate roughly to chutzpah or something with a bold attitude. Uh, but whenever you have uh, a definite article after the preposition, so cara do pau off plus the, we have a, a phonological contraction there, uh, then you have this generic reading, this uh, the, the dude, uh, related somehow to wood. And we're going to show this uh, uh, more general uh, behavior later. Uh, the same thing goes for uh, wheelchair, uh, cadeira de roda, or cadeira de rodas. You can have the plural in the second now, and, and that, that would still be OK. But you cannot say cadeira das rodas. And, and then uh, with the definite article being after the preposition, the whole structure feels uh, ungrammatical, weird. Uh, the same thing goes for uh, another set of data, such as saco de pancadas, uh, which means rough, uh, can be translated as punching bag. But then saco das pancadas is, again, uh, ungrammatical. And a host de festa, or party animal, is OK, but not a host das festas, or das, or da festa. Uh, so uh, we're going to try to explain this correlation between the loss of non-compositional reading whenever you have a definite article. And uh, we want to show that uh, the, the, main, uh, uh, the main properties that are triggering this kind of uh, difference in interpretation happen to whatever is after the preposition, which we are going to claim is a DP, uh, even though it's a compounding configuration. And we're going to show that the relation between definiteness and uh, structure as a whole uh, plays a, a, some, uh, a role uh, among this uh, reading uh, possibilities. So uh, we have uh, a context that is important to share and uh, will make the whole empirical contrast shown here uh, more relevant, which is the, the presence of a diminutive marker sometimes. And uh, uh, the cases where you have the, the use of in, uh, such as filhinho instead of filho, which would be the regular uh, word for son, then you, you can have uh, the non-compositional reading. But that is conditioned to the absence of definiteness in the second uh, now. So you can say um filhinho de papai or o filhinho de papai. So definiteness does not uh, have an issue uh, at, at the whole structure, uh, when it marks the whole structure. But whenever you have a definite uh, article after the preposition, so um filhinho do papai, uh, then you need to have the definite marking the, the, the whole structure as well. You cannot have a mismatch between features. So it's either both definite or uh, it, 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 it cannot happen at all. So uh, the same thing is for another, uh, another expression, which is uh, filhinho de mamãe. So, uh, for uh, filhinho, de, sorry, for filhinho de papai, you have something as trust fund baby or playboy. Uh, but if you have o filhinho do papai, then uh, whenever you have the definite article after the preposition, then this non compositional meaning disappears. And then it feels like something that is favorite son, which is not really a specific thing, but it's, uh, it's a more uh, direct uh, meaning based off the, the sum of its parts and the, the, the expression. So the same goes for uh, filhinho de mamãe, which is uh, a spoiled kid, mom, uh, mama's boy. And when you say uh, o filhinho da mamãe, which is the only uh, grammatical version and not um filhinho da mamãe, then you have something as mama's favorite son. Uh, so we see that the presence of the definite article on the bottom half of, of the structure, which we're going to see uh, later on, shows us that we do not uh, have this non-compositional reading within these structures, and there is a relation between definiteness and the interpretation possibilities. So whenever these articles occur after preposition de, we have this complement BP. So this is our hypothesis, which then blocks the non-compositional reading. 
and this bare noun complement cases are instances of compounding. So this is why uh, we claim that the, the composition, the non-compositional readings are possible because you have a whole structure mediated by the preposition, which is then selected by this uh, noun head. And then it's because of that, that the whole thing can have a different meaning, such as uh, all cases of uh, uh, idiomatic expressions. So uh, the presence of the diminutive in cases such as two, so the filinho uh, de papai or filinho de mamãe, they license the, the non-compositional reading despite the presence of this definite DP. However, uh, we can see that uh, there are other cases uh, in other languages such as Hebrew that show the same kind of parallel. So we can have something as uh, beta sefer in 3a, which means the school, but not a school. Uh, we can have the the uh, the this the, the same construct state in 3b as Beit Sefer without this uh, a, which marks the definiteness. And we have just school. And we can also look at the the, the free state nominals in 3c and 3d, where uh, you can have either the definite the the definite marker a ah, happening both house and book which bait and sefer uh, and then you have the house of the book or you can have bait share sefer where house and book both are unmarked for uh, definiteness and then you have house of books so uh, the non composition reading seems to be sensitive to specific uh, properties, including diminutive morphology. So uh, we have a difference between in and zin, which is a different way to use the diminutive. And because of morphophonological constraints, uh, they are even harder to be used. And we're going to see that they can only be used whenever you have an extreme discourse emphasis. And it doesn't matter if you uh, match the definiteness between what, what uh, occurs after the preposition or before it, you will have the same ungrammatical result. So, um filhozinho de papai or um filhozinho de mamãe are both bad. And the same for o filhozinho do papai or o filhozinho da mamãe. So, it doesn't matter if it's definite uh, either way, matching or, or not, or uh, de uh, without definiteness at all. And then you can have something that is fairly marginal when you say something like, Mas ele é um belo filhozinho de uma mãe mesmo. Or he is indeed quite the little son of a bitch. So whenever you use this kind of uh, uh, sentence, it is even, you have to put all these uh, modifiers and everything, even the prosody uh, has a little change. And only then you can use this, this expression. And it's not very natural or very, uh, it, it doesn't occur very often. So uh, Avelar, in 2006, says it's semantically impossible to foresee the relations between the preposition de and the nouns that uh, uh, connect to them regarding nominal adjuncts as opposed to other prepositions in general. So he calls uh, the preposition de an extremely, an extremely relational index under noun domains depicting any kind of relation between two nouns. So uh, we can see uh, the sentence in six the man of the car asked for Anna. And uh, the preposition the, marked with definiteness, has the, the following readings. So, uh, aquele rapaz que tem o carro mais bonito da rua perguntou pela Anna. So, you can say that rapaz do carro, so man of the car, can be the man has got the nicest car in the whole street. Or it can be the man inside the car or the man who wants to sell a car, or the man who wants to buy Maria's car, or the man who fixes cars, the man who was leaning against the car, or even the man who left. keeps talking about, about cars. Sorry. 10 minutes left. Okay, thank you. So in order to uh, bring some generalizations, we're gonna follow our hypothesis claiming that Whenever you have a determiner, you have a meaning layer. So uh, we're going to 
show uh, uh, the next uh, set of data, trying to uh, uh, convince you that we have a, a, a wide set of uh, meanings whenever you have a different determiner domain. So which Moritz calls a uh, phase and, and his works in 2001-2007. And we say that no matter the definiteness con context, it is always uh, the key factor for uh, the non-compositional reading types, the bottom noun, especially because it will be as a, a barrier of phase after the preposition. So the complement of the preposition is going to uh, be uh, varied. And whenever you have a, a DP on that position, you're going to have a different uh, possibility of, for readings, or you're not going to have the, the, the possibility of uh, varied readings, including non-compositional reading ones. So, uh, so the logical sum, so you have indefinite plus definite uh, nouns, then you have compositional reading. So we can uh, get uh, some examples relating to some expressions. So, well, son of, of the father, uh, un filho do pai, would mean a son of God. And then when you say, o filho do pai, the son of God, then you have an uncompositional reading, which means Jesus. So, it, uh, you have this kind of crystallized expression. But whenever you have indefinite, indefinite nouns, in these contexts is just weird. So, um filho de pai, a son of father, literally, uh, would be ungrammatical. And the same for o filho de mãe, the son of father. Uh, I'm sorry, father, not mother, uh, in the, the last example. So, uh, we can say that the drifting on this non composition reading may spread to the larger structure and uh, it would yield definite description results. So, and then we have uh, an expression uh, in Portuguese for um filho da mãe, which is, uh, so the whole thing is non-compositional, and it is a son of a bitch. Uh, o filho da mãe, it's uh, equally grammatical, uh, with a definite N on the top of the structure. Then whenever you see um filho de mãe, or o filho de mãe, then the structure just is not allowed because it seems that it is the bottom half of the structure, the, the, the th everything that happens after the preposition that acquires this specific meaning. So my here is read of not a mine, but something pejorative. And that's why the whole thing acquires the non-composition reading. So uh, on the other hand, whenever you try to use the diminutive, we see that the bottom now Definiteness is only allowed if inherited from the higher noun or if the features are matched. So we can say something as um filhinho do papai, which literally means a, a daddy's favorite son. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We cannot say um filhinho do papai, which literally says a daddy's favorite son, but we can say o filhinho do papai, so the daddy's favorite son. Uh, and then uh, um filhinho de papai, then if we did not have the definite marker on the bottom part of the structure, then I can interpret the whole thing as a single, the single noun per se, or a single compound noun. And then you can have a non-compositional reading that is derived for the whole thing and not just for, for the bottom part. So the definite, definiteness marks the barriers between where special meanings occur. And then whatever comes, whatever layer comes next, not necessarily left. gives a, I'm sorry. Five minutes left. Okay, could I just uh, finish in 30 seconds, please? Okay, so then you can see the, the pattern happens and with Zinu, none cases are allowed. So our proposal is just that we select two roots whenever we don't have the, the, the definite article in the end and the whole mini negotiation occurs condition to the selecting heads and so these would be the, the two different uh, possibilities. And then whenever you have a compositional meaning, so the structure on the right, whenever you have the DP, then uh, the, the asterisk N would not be able to select the structure for a special meaning. So uh, here are next steps, but I, I think they would be relevant for our discussion right now. 
So, and the next steps are going to be to compare uh, adjective compounds of the same sort in Brazilian Portuguese with English and Hebrew as well. Uh, okay. Julio, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but you still have four minutes. So, if, four minutes. So, if you would like to go back and go over, uh, over the, your conclusions, you can do that. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Have we have minutes. 20 minutes for presentation, right? Is that it? I'm sorry. I, I thought we had 15 and then five for discussion. I'm no, so no, no, you, you still have four minutes and then 10 for discussion. Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry for rushing through this then. Uh, so uh, I'm going to come back for the, the discussion and present this, this data a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. So we can see that whenever you have two nouns without definiteness marking them, so um filhinho de papai, uh, we have this whole thing becomes a full structure that has a special meaning. But uh, after this has happened, it doesn't matter if you have a definite marker for the whole structure. So o filhinho de papai or um filhinho de papai are the same thing because the meaning has already been set and it's already frozen. However, when we look at um filhinho do papai, you cannot have that because filhinho do papai only works as a definite description of sorts. So do papai is in the same way uh, as the data we've shown for uh, o homem do carro, the man uh, of the car, uh, where wherever we have a full DP as a complement to the structure, then the mini negotiation becomes a little more uh, more hard to do in this very specific meaning sense. So uh, for filhozinho, so we show that zinho is a different sort of uh, diminutive morphology and has specific properties. So Armelin 2015 and uh, there are other uh, people, including uh, uh, Minusi and uh, her student uh, Costa, who have already written uh, things about this, who show that uh, Inu and Zinho have different properties, and maybe Zinho could be interpreted as a whole word or a, a root of sorts, and not just as an affix. So uh, we are going to say that whenever you have this non-composition of meaning structures, we can select two roots, and they're going to be specifier and complement of the preposition. So this is the structure. So when you have something as wheelchair, you have, uh, or uh, chutzpah, right? cara de pau, face of wood, you have face or chair, so in the specifier of the preposition, and then you have another root as a complement, and the whole thing is uh, susceptible for uh, meaning presentation. That's where the little n selects, and this whole thing is a, seen as a word by the, by the syntax or, or uh, for our meaning purposes. But whenever you, you have a, a DP as the, the end structure, then you cannot have the same interpretation. So this is why cadeira do pau is something that can only be interpreted as a, a strict sense where the, the reading is not uh, very flexible. So uh, we're going to try to expand this discussion looking at other languages, such as English and Hebrew and, and, and others, and present more agreement evidence to, uh, to these, these facts presented here. We're going to look at quantification and definiteness as well and compare uh, now, now and uh, adjective compounds such as bonito de rosto, pobre de espírito, so face, uh, pretty of face or uh, dead of tiredness or dead of tired, which are compared to dead, dead tired, crazy, hungry, and so on. And yalda uh, yefat from Hebrew. So this data set is uh, uh, extracted from another uh, paper uh, Rafael and I are writing. And we're probably going to try to integrate these hypotheses into a single uh, line of work. Oh, I, uh, so here are some of the references. I hope it didn't blow up much of the time. And I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Congratulations, Julio. You've made it. Uh, thank you for such a remarkable presentation. In spite of all the problems we experience, we, I, I think you managed to, to, to do really well. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. And now we can move on to the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, if I understood correctly, you're claiming then that there's like a lexical entry that gets merged 
with, with the preposition as in silla de ruedas or cadeira de rodas. But I was wondering about um, what happened with uh, the plural form of rodas. Are you claiming that the lexical entry then has the plural form? Or you, you could say something like eh, silla de rueda, because th then for me that the, the expression is, is then doesn't have the, the non-compositional um, reading if you say it without the plural marking. And, and similarly, in other expressions, if you pluralize the thing that, that is under the preposition, then it no longer has that non-compositional reading. So I was wondering what happened there. Oh, all right. Well, thank you so much. That's, that is a very interesting point that you, uh, fact that you're pointing out. Well, yeah, uh, at least for uh, cadeira de rodas in Brazilian Portuguese, I think we can have some context where you can say cadeira de roda and it, it wouldn't be that that uh, impossible. But yeah, you're definitely right about the the, the plural uh, playing a factor in the interpretations. And we believe that uh, it's, uh, precisely because, well, oh, I'm sorry, I closed the, the slideshow. I'm gonna try to open it again. So whenever we look at these structures, so we look at the structure uh, on the right, whenever you have the DP, uh, it's uh, we're following uh, distributed morphology. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't mention this prior, but uh, the idea is that uh, the whole structure uh, for uh, do pau or the das rodas, that would have the same expanded structure. So it will have, uh, it would be a root selected by a noun and then selected by a determiner. So whenever we have das rodas, so if we have the plural on the bottom part, then it would definitely have a DP and that would block the non-compositional ring for cadeira das rodas in that sense. Uh, but uh, for uh, cadeira de rodas, then uh, we would say that this plural happens afterwards. So uh, after we have this uh, noun selecting cadeira de rodas, then the structure on the left, uh, then rodas would somehow uh, have this plural afterwards, the same way where you can have the, the diminutive uh, occurring on both places because there they seem to be some kind of ambiguous whether what uh, in what comes to their domains so it's why we can say something as uh bicicleta de uh, oh i'm sorry this is not a good example but uh mainly where you have pão de queijo which is a uh, bread of cheese or cheese bread uh we can say Pãozinho de queijo and put the diminutive um, um, bread, or you can say pão de queijinho. So it will depend on how the the person uh, who's uh, using these expressions still see the whole structure of, uh, or if the opacity uh, between uh, the, the 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 whole interpretation is already uh, obstructed this possibility of uh, different uh, plurals and and uh, diminutive. Uh, settings so i think that would be a, a way to answer it but perhaps not answering you i'm not sure but the, uh, it's an important thing to to uh, clarify thank you uh, thank thank you julio uh, and let me read a, a comment from, from youtube erica enis uh, nos dice felicidades la investigación y las conclusiones son excelentes Los casos e ejemplos que está presentando en portugués se ven muy paralelos a los cambios que suceden en inglés. ¿Es cierto? Is it, is it, is it correct? What do you think? Y yes. Uh, actually, uh, we're not telling the whole story here, but uh, the, this work is, uh, as uh, I, I briefly mentioned uh, in the beginning of the presentation, is a direct result of uh, our independent researches. So, um, Rafael uh, studied Hebrew and uh, throughout his uh, master's and PhD. And he looked at these structures that shared something, some, some sort of uh, properties uh, related to compounds. And uh, I studied resultative constructions in my master's. And then I looked at Snyder's compound parameter for my, for my PhD. And I did a structure analysis where I claimed that we don't have a whole parameter relating compounds in all those complex predicate structures that he mentions, but instead we have some se some separate things. So uh, I claim that compounds in uh, double object constructions are very similar and that they share this structure of the preposition. And then whenever you have uh, 
an absence of phonological content or phonological features for the preposition, then you have a reverse order. So this is why you have, I don't know, cup of coffee and coffee cup. So copo de café in Brazilian Portuguese or in English. Then you have the, the head of the compound being uh, in the left uh, of our pronunciation, but then you have coffee cup whenever the preposition is absent. So then you have this flip side, the same thing for double object. So John gave Mary a book or John gave a book to Mary. You have Mary and book just changing uh, positions. So it is uh, very nice that you, you point out this relation to English. And uh, I, I think that our, our uh, perceptions of these data comes from the comparison between these two and looking at Hebrew as well, because uh, of the whole uh, possibility of compositional readings for compounds in English. So it also adds to the to the hypothesis, uh, this comparison, but because of the, the time constraints, we decided to just show Brazilian Portuguese data foremost. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julio. And we still have time just for just one more question. Okay, Oscar, yes, just one more question. Unfortunately. If it's just one more, I think, it, I just follow up comments, so I'll, I'll give it to Tim. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I don't know if you've looked at this already, but but Spanish has these epithet expressions that Andres Saab and Margarita Sunier have looked at. Where you've got like two identical structures, right? El burro de Juan, right? And one of them is Juan's burro, and the other is, you know, that that idiot Juan, right? So, uh, uh, and the the second one is modifiable, right? El muy burro de Juan, whereas the other one's not. So. Uh, that might present a, a problem for your uh, analysis because they're different articles. Perfect. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, I I believe that uh, we, uh, we started looking at those, but we didn't have the the time to to refine uh, our, our uh, intuitions about it. But uh, what I could say, at least for uh, a few of data from Brazilian Portuguese. Whenever you say o burro do João, you have, at least in my dialect, you have to use the definite article for uh, do João. You cannot say o burro de João. If you do that, you would have to have a specific dialect in Brazilian Portuguese where you cannot have uh, the, the definite article to mark, uh, say, uh, a personal noun. But then it would be only uh, this adjunct where it means the uh, John's uh, donkey or something like that. But whenever you say o burro do João, uh, then uh, you can have either uh, you can have either readings. But then uh, I'm not sure of uh, whether this would be uh, totally a problem because we would have the same effect. So if you have definiteness in the bottom half, then uh, that that would still be João. And then buhu, which is above the structure, then will have the specific meaning, the non-compositional reading. So the root that is higher in the structure, so the specifier of p, would be affected by this little m. And then the the, the phase is the same. So uh, I'm not sure that would that would be a, a really strong problem, but we have to look further into it. So uh, thank you for for reminding me of this data set. Uh, thank you, Julio. Thank you for for presenting such a compelling topic and congratulations. Well, I thank you all and... Well, I thank you all and I would y also like... To, ahora, uh, to... con esto concluimos la sesión matutina del día de hoy. Muchas gracias nuevamente a todos nuestros invitados por su tiempo, por compartir su experiencia, que sin duda nos aportará mucho en nuestras propias investigaciones y prácticas docentes. Les recuerdo que la sesión expertina comenzará a las 15 horas, 15 minutos, hora de la Ciudad de México. Agradecemos mucho, uh, uh, agradecemos mucho la participación de todos y todas en esta emisión. Agradecemos también a todo el equipo técnico que hizo posible la transmisión de este evento. Y muchas gracias a todas y todos por acompañarnos. Hasta luego.